No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and today we're going to have an unbelievable history lesson. A whole lot of game is about to be spilt all over this table. JT, the bigger figure, is joining us today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How you doing, Jay? Hey, man. Happy to be here, my guy. Hey, man. It's a real honor to have you in here, and I know that we're going to get a, a serious history lesson. Yeah, we're going we gonna to get into it, man. It's, it's a... It's a 30-year run right here. I feel like this is going to have a 30-year run time by the time we're done recording this. So, okay, let's talk about from the very beginning. Where were you born and what was your upbringing like? I was born in San Francisco, 1973, Mount Zion Hospital, Filmo, on Divisadero Street. I was born November 8th. For whatever reason, the next day they kicked my mama out the hospital. Really? And I was in Martin Luther King Projects. They call it KO right now, Eddie Street. And that's my very beginning. Really? Getting kicked out the hospital. While you were being born, she was evicted. No, I, I, after she had me, the next day, for whatever reason, she was at the house across the street from the, from the hospital. Holy shit. That's how it begins. That's how it begins. So when you say, how did it begin? Drama out the beginning. Turbulence from the very beginning. From the very beginning, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And so um, you well, – describe your childhood. What was it like uh, besides that? Um, I just want to say it's basic. You feel me? Uh, pops, you know, had another plan, moved on. Mom's, you know, taking care of me, my brother, my sister. Um, my early upbringing uh, was, a, of course, a lot of bike riding, back flipping, uh, backflipping was popular back then. Like, Just you know, standing backflips? Backflipping off a car, mm. backflipping off the first floor, you know, at the park, at the top of the, you know. So that was the beginning stages of something that you get credit for that I could remember in my young life. Like, First whoever know how to Developing backflip, clout through be- something. Through something you know how to do. Yes, sir. When yes, you have sir. nothing, people will fi- still find ways to differentiate <laughs> themselves from everybody else. That's right. That's okay. right. So the next phase was the bikes, mm-hmm. you know, um, the BMX bikes. I, I rode BMX bikes the for many GTs, years. Yeah, the Mongoose, the Red Line. That was exciting. Do you have any tricks, wheelies? Um, I wasn't that good, but I was good at putting them together. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. So that was the next phase of my status in the neighborhood. From there, um, I would say the life of being outside at 13, 14, being able to sell drugs and get introduced into how to make some money, that was the next phase. But music was part of that, the early stages. You okay. know, um, just the 50-year hip-hop, my first uh, interaction with the music, uh, Run DMC. Um, that's the very beginning. Somebody mm-hmm. brought a tape to uh, elementary school. And when I got that tape, you know, the, the music started to impact me because I'm like, yo, this is... I mean, I'm a kid, but I'm like, this is exciting to us. Some called rap, right? A different type of music. But it's when did you when did you start selling drugs, and how long were you doing it before you got into the music? The selling drugs part, I never was good. Because, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I never made it. I mean, as a, even as a youth, there's youth that have monetized the dope game into some real business. But for me, as soon as I make a thousand, two thousand dollars, I want to buy bike parts, or I want to buy the Nintendos or Segas or something. So it was wasted. That learning how to sell drugs was, I think. It's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. But what I learned from it was you got to buy something for this price. Right. And then double your money by getting out here. Right. So that same concept, uh, that's how I got the music. That's how I got into the music at 14. Um, While I was doing my little street stuff, going to Pier 39, I recorded six songs. This is 1988. And Pier 39 is like a local studio? Pier 39 studio? is a, it's like a, a amusement amusement dock. It's, on the, it's right on the water. It's a little place with video games, food. And you could pay $20 and go in the studio. And when people walk by, they had the mic booth right there. They had the lyrics for you to sing any of the popular rap music. Oh, okay. So I went in there and spent $20 per song. I did six songs. I'll never forget. I spent $120. Which at the time was a lot. Was very much a lot. Right. And I was rapping over Parents Don't Understand. I was rapping over Run DMC, uh, Walk This Way, LL Cool J, I Need Love. These were songs that was on TV, but you could pay the money and they'd play the instrumental and you could either say their lyrics or say your own. 
So that was my beginning stages of freestyle because I didn't say their lyrics. I just was making up songs. I had my homies with me. And that's the beginning of me wanting to be an artist. At 14, I recorded six songs. Mm. They had these radios called Panasonic Decks. Mm -hmm. And back then, it was two cassette tapes. So you could put your cassette tape in here, and then you could give me your blank and put it in this side, and I could high-speed record my six songs. If there's any young people watching this, just don't forget how lucky you are to be able to record something on your phone or off your computer yes. or whatever. Because think about how much work you were having to put in that just, was to work. just get a recording of anything. To just get a recording, and then I had to buy this radio that you could walk with with the two speakers and the two tape decks, and that's how I was able to get my music out as a kid. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was doing manufacturing and distribution. Mm. I didn't realize that. But if you fast, well, if you fast forward from 1988 to 1990, I I got locked up as a you know they took me from my my mom as a uh, what they call it, uh, you a ward of the state. I had okay. gotten went to juvenile too many times, so I got locked up for a year. Before we do the jail stuff, can I just ask? How foreign was it or how new was it to be rapping on the West Coast? Because I remember interviewing Too Short and him basically telling me that he was like the first West Coast rapper and that the West Coast was kind of slow to catch up because you know, you're talking about Run DMC and like hip hop was so from New York that it took a while for the West Coast to, to right. catch up. Was it was, Did it stand out to you at the time like that it would be a very strange turn of events? As a teenager... Recording them songs in in 1988, Too Short was officially platinum mm. with Don't Fight the Fell and him and rapping Fote, who happens to be from Filmo. Legend. That is what tied me to the to the industry by rapping Fote. Somebody from my neighborhood, from San Francisco, on a song with somebody from Oakland. Mm. And not only is he from Oakland, Too Short got a deal with Jive Records. So that song, Don't Fight the Feeling, that went platinum and that's what made me feel because I didn't I always knew the New York they run the music it wasn't really till 88 80 89 when NWA you know when they got on the scene there was artists before NWA but from like an independent perspective and from a perspective of um like this new sound of music is just pure the you know the police you know uh shoot the Sell the dope, you know, just blatantly, but over dope beats. That's when I think, that's what also was fueling me by listening to that music. Mm. You know, Too Short had came out in 1984. Of course, you know, I was just a, a super little kid, but hearing his story talking about, I made songs where I put everybody's name in it, and then I go record it and come back. And I didn't put all these big time dope dealers and pimps and you know popular people in my neighborhood. I put their names in the in the songs, and that's how I began to get popular fast. Right. And selling my stuff out the trunk because people would hear these popular guys like, "Whoa, this little this rapper got a tape out, but he talking about the neighborhood and the people." So I seen. Too sure to do that. I did that in field mode where I went and named all the popular people I can name on my first Right, because I think I remember Too Short talking about having that same technique of like getting yes. everybody in the neighborhood to fuck yes. with it by just putting them in the songs. Yes, man. That is what I learned. As a young child, I recognized when I heard that story, that's what gave me the 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 drive to want to record with other artists and network with these people over here and go over here because the more connections, the better. Right. The more connections, the better. So then what what were you getting in trouble with that led up to you going to jail the first time? I think I want to say mostly stealing cars, um, stealing some more cars, getting cars. <laughs> that was the thing at the time? <laughs> yeah, stealing cars. Like how I was popular now? In 1988, between the, amongst the... 12 year olds to 17, that was popular too. So I don't never think it's a, a generation that yeah. that's actually not popular. Yeah. Um, but after you go to juvenile so many times, at a certain point, you know, you're going to have to pay for it. Um, I got caught selling rocks. It, uh, it was less than less than an ounce, less than a half ounce. You know, it was I wasn't a big dope dealer. It was just like, you get 100 extra dollars, let me go buy me a, 
a eight ball chopping down. I could make 175, 200, you know, to try to get up to my 500, the thousand, just keep going because everybody's doing it. It's and so new at that time. And it was like the money that was coming in, like, man, this is better than the job. Right. But as a youth, you don't understand that, you know, you're going to have to pay for this if you if you do get caught. And if you keep getting caught mixed with doing other crimes, you can't do this forever. You're not going to get away forever. So at a certain point, I had to pay the price for it. And, um, you know, a lot of youth, that's how we learn. Mm-hmm. You know, take this serious. You could play with fire if you want to, but, boy, Keep your hand in there. You're going to feel the pain. You're going to feel the burn. You're going to get burnt. How long were you locked up for? Just a year. Okay. But w- w- within that year, it was a, a place uh, called Log Cabin Ranch. And it's not actually a jail facility. It's a dorm. Uh-huh. And then they have bungalows for school. They have a rec hall. They got the football field, the, the swimming pool. So basically the basketball, it was almost like, it was jail, but it was like training down there. It was like, well, I guess it was prepping me to be comfortable in jail. I could say that. Because okay. once you leave Log Cabin Ranch, you go to California Youth Authority. And that's the real lockup. That's the gladiator school. But while I was there, they had music videos playing, and they kept playing Public Enemy, NWA, DOC, Easy E, you know, Easy E and Ice Cube fell out, you know, all that. So watching that from from this lockup facility was when I get out, I want to be like, damn. I bet they don't play a lot of rap videos for the prisoners these days. They I pro- think, I think, <laughs> for, I think for the phones they got it anyway. Okay, yeah, well, definitely true. But I don't they don't think, have to. I don't think. Well, you know what? I did see on Instagram and in some in some jails they do had the music videos playing. Okay. Yeah, well, I they did. just don't play music videos on TV anymore. So, and I would assume the jail. At a certain point, is going to figure out like, oh, if we play "fuck the police" around the prisoners, that's not going to be good <laughs> for their not behavior. Good for business, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but so do you feel like how much did jail change you? Like people always have stories about how it kind of turned them out and got them doing crazier stuff. It's basically you're just learning different crimes from all these different f- fucked up kids in that area, right? I think, of course, that conversation was there. It was available for future crimes when you get out and how to be better. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But for me, um, I think seeing them rappers on TV with the big chains and LL Cool J and them and, you know, these rappers that that, that we celebrate now, you know, to, to us youth, seeing that this is a new genre, this is the new thing. Mm-hmm. And I wanted that. I wanted that. I think I wanted that more than meeting my first Mexican plug and now I got kilos in the hood. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of stories, once you go to juvenile, you get to hear... Then, of course, jail, you hear it more. If you didn't see it on the streets, you definitely hear it there of how people was able to get a plug, and now that's why they hood balling. Mm-hmm. Your uncle been balling all these years because he got a plug, not that was because the dream. y'all actually, you know, really was making motion. No, you had the plug to make motion. Mm-hmm. But when you see other guys up, sometimes you don't know they get in front of the pack. It's not actually they pack. Right. You know, even on Instagram, a lot of dudes flexing money. Yeah, that it looked good, but that's that's the plug money. You got to turn that in, mm-hmm. you know. So I didn't want to be a middleman. I didn't want to have to work for nobody, and I knew I didn't have no plug. And that, I think, seeing Scarface, watch a Scarface movie, and, and you know, uh, uh, these different movies that that impact you to make you want to be a big dope dealer, like the the bad guy. He got the dope. He got the guns. He got the girls. You know, but. For my young mind, it was like shit. I want the money. Mm. I want to be like I want to be like Easy E. He owned the record label. Right. Then I watch Ice Cube spin off. Now he got his own. You know, got it. Lynch Mob. You know, but I'm seeing these dudes going into executive positions. Mm-hmm. Suge Knight going from bodyguard to CEO. I, I need in on that. E40. You know, dope boy. Go to college, come back from college, start a record label, CEO, he the artist, and he the executive producer. Uh, watching that, it jumped into me. It jumped into me. Like, I could definitely say I didn't want the the big dope dealer uh, stripes because it just looked like that's a harder thing for me, you know. That's really good that you had that intuition. Yeah, I feel I, like I, a lot of kids have yeah. the examples of how to succeed legally right in front of them, and they're kind of like, nah, I'm going to just – Try to trap instead. Well, trapping is more easier because the hood, most of the hood that you grew up, if you grew up in the hood, 
You see those who got that motion, and even if they go to jail or some of the crew die or whatever, you always seen them had a consistency of having some type of money, a car, mm -hmm. the jewelry, some actual money, maybe the apartment or a better house or two apartments, you know, the ch they children, uh, clothes is nice or, you know, his girl got her car, she got a hair shot, but everybody know they working together and, you know, so that concept is always there, but when you start seeing black men successful from something else that don't have nothing to do, actually do with going to jail or crime, that do feel better, but it looks harder because mm. it take your drive, your talent, and determination. Right. And that that impacted me. Like I say, the E forties, the too short, the rapping forte, the the uh, Easy E, the the Dr. Dre, the D O C, the Suge Knight. To see this and to actually be here, the Ice Cube spinning off. Now he got movies and different things. Like, whoa, your ideas is the money. Mm -hmm. Money, not the money. Your idea is the money. Right. So I took that, man. And that's, you know, that's how I've been, I've been running this for the 30 year run. Same blueprint. You got to start with something that you own that give you a guaranteed way to either sell your intellectual property or license it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't own nothing, then you're not entitled to nothing that's coming your way unless you're just looking for someone to discover you or, you know, I want to get a big check, I want a big deal. But what do you own right. by that? So you get out of jail, and how do you continue to work on your music career? Because um, you're still pretty young, right? Okay, yep. Uh, I got out. I was, I was 16. No, I was 17. I got locked up when I turned 16. I When I got out, I turned 17, and then a few days later, I got out, and then I said, "Man, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a rap artist, or I'm gonna be, you know, I'm on a record label." Of course, I didn't have no deal. I had no knowledge except what I'm seeing, what I'm listening to. Uh, oh, and I gotta say something about rap a lot records too, because that them Ghetto Boys tapes made me feel some kind of way too. Mm. Yeah, shout out to Scarface and them. But 91 was the year to figure out how to be an artist. What do artists do? You need a record label. You need a manager. You need a studio. You need an engineer. Mm -hmm. These are the next phases of, of my desire. Uh, learning these proper steps so I could be independent. I didn't know that was the goal that I would say that I would be saying so much independent. I'm gonna do it on my own because I actually wanted a label to sign me. I actually wanted a manager to help me and sign me. And at that time, it was like basically impossible to be successful as a rapper if you didn't have a label, right? Yeah, and two, it's not many examples. It's not many. Gotta get on the radio, gotta get your records in stores. You're just not gonna be able to pull it off yourself, unless you're Master P, but that didn't that scenario didn't unfold until like much later. Yes, yes. Um, I would say this though, for, for the Bay Area, Too Short was an example. But he got to deal with Jive very quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we didn't see him on no corner no more pressing tape. So that's right. out the way. But who came after that was the Mac Dre Young Black Brother record. Shout out to Kyrie and them. They started the manufacturing of your own tape to put it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to give uh, credit to Huey MC from Filmo. I got to give credit to uh, Cool Nut and IMP Records out of Lakeview and Frisco because they actually had a movement because they were printing their tapes up. So whoever had the information of, hey, if you can't get a record deal, you actually had to print up your own tapes and then you gotta take them to the record store. Mm -hmm. The record store not looking for you. You had to present to the record store your posters, your flyers. You had to make yourself available to come and sit in this store when customers come in to help promote your record. So these was the, the, um, the steps necessary to even get yourself going. But if you never saw this before, then how would you even have that same desire? All you know is, I'm gonna make a demo, I'm sending it to Def Jam, I'm sending it to Universal, I'm sending it to Priority Records, and then I'm hoping, hoping for a phone call back. Mm -hmm. That was a method. Like you say, um, or like P. Diddy say, yeah, I was uh, working for LaFace and going through these demos and I found this girl named Mary J. Blige. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I called her and next thing you know, it's history. Right. But for us, when we found out, man, you could send your tape in, you ain't the only one. It's a thousand other people taped and landed this week too. Right. So you actually in a pile of cassette tapes and there was no email back then. Mm -hmm. 
you know, um, there was the pagers, uh, and you had a house phone. You didn't have no cell phone. Mm -hmm. So you had to put your actual address, you had to put your pager number, and you had to put your phone number, and then hopefully you can get the call back. So what E40 and them had done, they created mo motion by you had to print your own stuff up, and then I got a hold to that knowledge in, um, in 1992. Mm -hmm. In 92, when I got that knowledge, shout out to Black Sea from RBL Posse. They came out with a tape at the end of 91, early 92, Don't Give Me No Bammer Weed, blew up. Um, they actually was from across town in Hunters Point. I'm from Filmo, but we had squashed the beef between our neighborhoods that was fighting, and I happened to be part of that meeting in Black Sea, so we became friends from that. So we ended up doing a song called Frisco Niggas Ain't No Punks in 92, and from doing that right there, his information to me opened up the doorway when he said, Jay, if you want to print your tape, go down to Music Annex and you can manufacture your own cassette tape. Was that the, the common perception at the time that if you were from Frisco, you were a punk? Kind of like because the gay community uh -huh, yeah. in, in the whole America, the first popular gay community was San Francisco. Whenever people want to diss Atlanta, they always bring that up now. But they used to do it to us first. <laughs> uh, what, what Snoop Dogg say, uh, some, some might, he acting like a Frisco dyke. Oh, yeah, oh, of course. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. Why he did us so dirty oh, on a popular oh, song that yeah. we love. It's tough to overcome that, yeah, huh? Yeah, man, that, that right there, bro. But think about I it. I remember being a kid and thinking, like, what the fuck is a Frisco dyke? A Frisco dyke. dyke. I didn't Listen. know what a, a dyke was, and I didn't know what Frisco was. <laughs> but that, but that was so that was so uh, that was so devastating to us because while while he dissing Easy E, he threw us in there. Mm. So whatever Atlanta going through about the little dissing, mm. we got hit first. <laughs> <laughs> we got hit first. That's man. hilarious. So wait, okay, you had some other like legal problems when you were young too, right? Like you got arrested for a drive by at one point, right? That was in 1989, but that's what actually sent me. That's why you went to prison that one time. Yeah. So it was a bunch of violations and shit, but then that was the that icing was on the I cake. think. But nobody actually got killed or anything. Uh, somebody got hit. It wasn't who I was shooting at. It just turned out to be, you know, they didn't find a gun. It wasn't really enough evidence, but I was in the car, so all of that, it just... But what kind of shit were you doing in your life that had you doing a drive-by? Were you really in the streets like that? I, I feel like you might be trying to clean your image up a little bit. No, nah, but you know, actually, <laughs> I wouldn't even consider myself a gang member, a gangster, none of that. I just, the neighborhood, mm. more people lean toward the violence. Right. But I would say... By the time I turned 15, from 13, from 12 to 15, it, there was a couple killings, a couple people we lost. Um, so, of course, your pain, you could feel a certain way. Um, that's when I started really repping the field more, when I seen that people would come to our neighborhood and shoot, you know. Uh, so we, you know, that's, 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 I, I can't claim the tough guy in me. I can't claim that I was thugging so hard. I would steal your car, break in your house probably more than I would shoot you. Right. Because I, there's no money in that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but getting some money out your car was way more important to me. Your radio, your rims, something in the car, or going in the house, get your TV, your stereo. You know, back then it was a TV, you know, system. <laughs> Uh, maybe you had some weed or something under your under your bed or now something. Now you got a nice ass TV. It's like five hundred bucks, thousand bucks. <laughs> but they're a lot smaller now. Nah, but back then definitely. <laughs> if you if you had some, it was definitely one of them ones, mm. and that was that was worth a lot back right. then. Yeah. Okay. So the house burglary card thing, I think I had more stripes for that than anything else. Definitely. So okay, where where do you go from there? Um. Like I say, when I came home, I was infatuated with the music. And I knew that the life of crime, for me, I don't think I was going to have good luck. I think because I come from a spiritual family, you know, I come from a praying mama, praying family, grandmama, mm -hmm. you know, uh, do the right thing, son. Uh, don't follow those guys out there. I mean, a lot of us had that. But, you know, we still make our own decisions and, and dibble and dabble, you know, within them streets. 
But moving forward, though, I would say that the music just took over because by 92, my dreams start coming true without even no record deal or no manager because I got a hold to information. What was that? The information was, if you want to be in the record game, go print up your own tapes. Record it in whatever studio you want. Take your master. Back then, it was called Dat Tape. Mm -hmm. And it was about this big. You take your Dat Tape to a manufacturer, and you pay for your copies. And they put your name on the tape, and... You know, they put your record label logo on the tape. You give them the artwork. You pay for it. When you get your copies, drive to the record store yourself. That information blew my young mind because mm. I became the product now. It wasn't that I wanted 10 pounds of weed, 100 pounds of weed, and I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to blow up or I got 10 kilos or 3 kilos of powder I could cook this up and, you know, blow this up and give me some big money and take flight. Nah, I can make these cassettes. I mean, I can make these songs and go print up 500 tapes, 1,000 tapes, 2,000. I got up to 5,000 cassette tapes to a teenager. I've been sending my demos out. These folk ain't called Jet. Mm -hmm. I didn't send my shit. Uh, I don't think it was uh, FedEx back then. It was, it was mail. But if you want priority mail back then, it was $75, 65 That means that they put it on the desk of wherever you're sending it to, priority mail. Man, I can remember spending, I can remember spending damn near $1,500, mm -hmm. $75, $50 a pop to try to get to Def Jam or the Island Records or the Priority Records or Atlantic Records. And I remember getting these executives' names in their offices and and I'm like, shit, boy, with that information, when them calls didn't come and heartbreak and I felt like I did good music and then I got the knowledge to do it myself, I said, I ain't looking back. And you never got anything back from any of the labels? I never got nothing back from those guys. Mm. Nope. But I remember this being like a conversation for like people that I knew who were starting bands and stuff is that if you were trying to get on, you would just have to just send your shit to the labels. You have to. Yep. And just pray. And, and... Some took it a step further and came to the office. Go there, yeah. Back then, it wasn't like a police officer at the front patting down or blocking, you know. Like, back then, you could actually go knock on the door and be like, uh, is Mr. Vine here or mm. Weinstein? I'm, you know, and he would be upset that some guy is here <laughs> because, you know, the more, then they got to the point where they put the front desk and you got to get buzzed in and all of that. Mm -hmm. But at certain points, but... To fly to New York. Back then, the airplane ticket was something nasty, mm. you know, uh, in the early 90s. And then, where am I going to stay? There, You know, early 90s. There was no internet to Google this, Google that. It was a yellow book. It was your white pages. And then you look, or you call operator for New York to try to find something you're looking for. So, printing up these cassette tapes and then... Eventually, a year later, it went to compact disc. Mm. A cassette tape cost, at that point, um, $0.65 cent to manufacture. The wholesale price or the retail price was $10, $11 for Run DMC, NWA, whoever. Cassette tape. But your wholesale for the record label to a distributor would be 5 to $6. Mm -hmm. So the distributor now is going to sell it for seven or eight dollars. At that time back then, the store and the distributor was making maybe two dollars, mm -hmm. three dollars per unit. When Compact Disc came out, they were a dollar twenty-five for one thousand. So you spent twelve hundred and fifty dollars for one thousand compact discs. But whoever manufactures, when I drop it off to a distributor, I would drop it off for eight dollars. Mm -hmm. That margin of profit was way better than cassette tapes and then our revenues blew up starting from 93 moving forward and um dr dre put out the chronic album november 16th 1992 and i dropped my album november 16th 1992 uh don't stop till we major with the song with rbl posse mm -hmm. I, I i remember when the compact disc came out and I wanted to hear the quality of my mixes against his mixes. And, like, why is his so much better? But over time, we got to see, oh, Dr. Dre don't record on these little ADATs and no little uh, 
eight tracks and all that. No, he got the 24 inch tape and he going through a SSL board on his mixes and he got all these need plugins. So the concept of your quality, Dr. Dre is the one that that introduced the next level of sonicness mm. of through mixing and sound effects and the doctor office and the game show. You know, the, the chronic album was something. Right. So for me as a producer, I began to to try to emulate that. One year later, in 93, when the di compact disc came out, Snoop Dogg dropped November 18th, 1993, and I dropped my album, coincidentally, November 18th, 1993. Players in the game, Snoop Dogg came out with Doggy, uh, what is it? Doggy Style. Yeah, Doggy Style. Mm -hmm. Man, and then... For me to sell a significant number and chart in the Bay, even though Snoop was the hottest anticipated person, like this is the first time that the lines is down the street for this new album anticipation is coming out at midnight. I remember seeing it on the news. Um, but I was popular within the Bay Area, though. I'm not big as Snoop, but for the Bay, JT got a new album dropping, too. I didn't put posters all over the city, all over Oakland, Frisco, Richmond. So I had learned the game from my previous product in 92, doing the cassettes. And then when 93 came, I remember starting with 5,000 compact discs. And I remember the distributor owed me $40,000. And when you press up 5,000 discs, it's not $1.25 no more. It's 90 cents. Mm. And if you order 10,000, it go down to 70 or 65 cents. You're so out it's here like loving the, more, the quantity discount. Man, but the wholesale price never changed. So our financial power, you know, imagine I'm 20, what, I was 20 years old. Man, they owed me 40,000 mm. off of just me dropping them off. It's so amazing because nowadays the goal of a rapper is to get you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people to listen to your stuff so that you can make like a fraction of a penny per listen. Yes. People, yes. But back then, like you didn't know, I'm sure you were feeling it, but you didn't know how good you got it. You didn't know how this shit was going to go away. <laughs> that this, listen, I didn't realize that this was going to be the movement that it is. Like I knew that I'm happy that I know about these prices. Right. But I knew once the streets Find out mm. that you can take some rapper from your neighborhood, pay for some studio time, get it done, manufacture some product, put a logo, get your artwork done. It's an investment. But when you finalize that and you print up ten thousand, let's just say for six thousand five hundred, when you drop off ten thousand compact discs to Walter Zelnick at City Hall Distribution in the Bay Area. He owe you eighty thousand dollars off of some you spent six thousand on manufacturing costs. And imagine if you own your own studio at that time, who well, you're not paying for studio time. You and I'm in my mom's house just making stuff. I got the whole neighborhood coming in my mama house. Mm -hmm. Master P them been there, RBL been there, uh, Silk the Shocker, C Murder, like uh, uh, E Forty. They coming to mom's house, mm -hmm. so I wasn't spending money. So my overhead was so low but the the profit the profitability of me that's why we said we didn't want to sign when i sent you my demo to your record label you never called back now in the 93 94 95 we the hottest thing they talking about what there's a movement in the bay of a bunch of guys making their albums in their house printing them mm -hmm. up and the money that's coming in the record labels flocked to our area to grab whatever was available. How much do you think was the the most money you ever had at one time during that era? I want to say off off cassette tapes, DVDs, I got to say probably about 400. Okay. About 425. You were moving DVDs as well? DVDs and cassette tapes. How'd you get into the DVD thing? No, I'm sorry. CD, compact disc. Oh, CDs, disc. right. Yes, compact okay. disc first. Compact disc because I not only did I make an album, I started producing albums for everybody in my neighborhood. I made group <laughs> albums. Then I started making compilations where I just get a song from everybody in the Bay or everybody in the city or, you know, whatever artist I can get my hands on and then I give it my own title. That was cheaper than developing a new artist where I got to pay for all his studio time, do his photo shoots, pay for his videos, uh, you know, pay for his promo runs. 
Nah, the new game became compilations. Just buy a song from different guys, make one project, and now you own this product. I know. I always think about that, how crazy that is now, because it wouldn't really make any sense because it's all streaming now. But, like, that used to be a crazy business model. It's like, I'm going to find 10, 20 artists. Yes. And and the punk bands I used to listen to when I was a kid, this was a thing. The metal bands I used to listen to, they did the same thing. You get 10, 20 you put them on a project, and those some of those projects became famous as fuck Man, at that time. Man, listen, that that concept, um, in 94, in 94, I did a compilation out of everybody from Fillmore, and I called it Get Low Players, mm-hmm. GLP, me, San Quinn, Demo the Youngster, Seth the Gaffler, uh, Bushy Mo, Ive Low, Black Nate, uh, Rob Blow. Like, these is guys that rap in my neighborhood, but they not actually rappers that got tapes out. But in our neighborhood, when it's a party, these particular guys would be perform, would perform right? Mm-hmm. So I said, let's just make a, a like a group album like Dr. Dre made, The Chronic, and Phil Mo, we gonna make a project, and we gonna call it GLP. When that blew up, automatically, because now JT has produced all these beats and introduced a whole bunch of new people to listen to, a guy named Herm Lewis said, ah, I'm going to get a, a song from you, JT, and then everybody in San Francisco and make a San Francisco compilation. When that came out a few months later, it was like, whoa, this comp thing going. Then Master P said, ah, I'm going to get you, JT, Herm, and everybody in the Bay Area. And all three of us, we laid the foundation for the compilation game, starting with me and the GLP. Well, because was this at the time that the ma- that Master P was living in the, in the Bay? Bay Area, yep, he was living in the Bay he, Area. Him and his family moved up there to where? Oakland, or he moved to uh, Richmond, California. Right, and I remember the story of being that basically they thought that their their area was so war ridden that they wanted to kind of get away from a lot they of the violence right into and shit, it. and they moved right into another they fucking moved war right zone. Into right into another war zone, Richmond, California. Uh, Master P and them though they held themselves down. But he, they definitely came here for a better, a better life. <laughs> they got a rude awakening. <laughs> and then got a rude awakening. But I think, you know what? When you move to somebody else's neighborhood and they got a war going, you're not part of it yet mm. until you add yourself, until you until you become part of the soil, and then you begin to have your own conflict. And if you rapping, it's only a matter of time, right? It's a matter of time. And he had a record store. So I never, I mean, I heard things, but Master P, though, was very smart in paying attention to the shift in the game because he had put out a couple cassette tapes, but they were they were they were really corny though. Okay, you know what I mean not no disrespect to Master P because he didn't find himself yet. Mm. He was trying to put out like his album covers would have him wearing a suit on on a uh, gangster car like Al Capone holding a Tommy gun. Mm. Like it didn't re- it looked <laughs> like it just looked like okay this is you know, right. But then at a certain point, on the first album, I did I did a track for him, a couple tracks on his first album, and I helped market and promote that called uh, The Ghetto Trying to Kill Me. And if you look on this album, he laying in a bed in some in some girl room with the girl sitting on him, and then the, her boyfriend is in the window holding a gun looking at him, mm-hmm. and, it's, and it's called The Ghetto Trying to Kill Me. So I helped Pete. Introduce, help introduce Pete into the market with a little more respect because now he with JT. Not that he just because he with me, so let me be clear. He probably needed but some I helped, counseling. He needed a, a cosign. Right. I'm the first one to cosign Master P. Nobody else in the Bay. Fody them didn't touch him. Nobody didn't touch P until he got to a certain level of hotness. But I'm the first one to stamp him and cosign him. And shout out to EA Ski and them in Oakland. They also stamped him, cosigned him. And that album took flight. But when that album came out and I was on his album and he seen the results and he seen the compilation, he like, man, I'm finna do the the Bay, the Bay uh, West Coast Bad Boys. And we like, come on with it. And he paying everybody too? Uh-huh. Yeah, P was smart. He paid for the whole Bay. And then that's how he got his official big kickoff mm-hmm. because he had the respect of the Bay now. Like, shit, boy, I got all your favorite rappers on my project. It's just wild because nowadays it would be so hard to imagine a rapper from anywhere down south just moving to Northern California and being like, oh, I'm doing my thing here now, and then to have it actually take off. Because even though hip-hop isn't regional in the same way now, where like people listen to music from all over the country, certain rap scenes are very insular and don't seem like they're going to be that receptive to people from out of town, right? No, nah, that is very true. Um, 
I, I do got to say, I've been blessed to do it. Right, yeah. When I moved to Atlanta. That's one thing that stands out about your story. What year did you move to Atlanta? I moved to Atlanta in 2010. Okay, so that's a little bit later in the story. Yeah. So, okay, between this era of you, uh, you know, making all this money independently, tell me if I'm jumping ahead way too much, but you end up running into a rapper who begins to be known as The Game. That's 2002, so let's back up and go to 1995 when I signed with Priority Records. Okay, so you do finally end up signing. Okay. Uh, yeah, finally do. Um, and shout out to Priority Records for uh, giving me that shot. One thing I could say that I didn't do right that I think was my biggest. Well, I could say it's two things, but let me just start with this one. Um, being so independent, I think I got, when I signed with them, they was trying to get my publishing and they was trying to get my master's in copyright. When I say that, that means they wanted to be co-owners in my publishing, in my copyrights, and in my master's. But I rejected that part and said I only want to do distribution for now, <laughs> you know, maybe in the future. Mm. When I did that deal with Priority, they kind of didn't like that because they only own 24% of revenue that come in. They manufacture, they deduct their costs, and then the balance of the money, they take 24 and I take the balance. When you're dealing with major labels, there's an extent to which you really want to be in bed with them because you want them to be forced to basically make up their investment. Yes. They need to have skin in the game if they're really going to push you. Yes, but I had a unique situation where I didn't have to give those things up, so mm. I got the benefit of doing the deal. But when Master P, I signed April 3rd, 1995. Master P signed April 17th, 1995. So a few days later, because I remember he called me, Atlantic Records wanted to do something with us. Uh a number of other record labels, but Priority was talking distribution, manufacturing. This was the beginning of the new business model of finding labels without having to sign their artists. Let's just sign a label for manufacturing distribution. That began in 95, and me and Master P and uh, Brother Lin Chung, um, uh, Black Market Records, uh, there's a number of other companies, a uh, matter of fact, Freeze records that Jay Z and Dame Dash was going through when they put out uh, Dead Presidents through Priority. Reasonable and, doubt. Reasonable the first doubt album that came right. through Priority also. So shout out to them boys because they definitely turned it into some. But that manufacturing and distribution blueprint, Master P, did the deal for the copyright, for the publishing, for the masters. You know he didn't sell it, just the merger where they own a little bit more, they can give a little more push to what they have a bigger percentage in. Mm -hmm. And that is something that as a young mind, my young mind, when I signed with them, I was 21. Master P was 26, 27. So he had a head start on wisdom and knowing, shit, well, I gotta get him a little bit more. Mm. JT playing hardball, I'm finna play, I'm finna play, I'm finna play to, to win. Right. But I was too young to understand that concept because I'm like, all I heard was horror stories. Once you put your publishing, your copyrights, shit, Michael Jackson arguing about his shit. Why would I want to get mine, get mine up? Or right. you know, uh, Stevie Wonder going through it. Uh, you know, all these the, the greats who went through problems of when they want to wiggle or Prince. You know these. these Any people, music fans been listening to those stories the entire that's time? That's all. I'm yeah. TLC. To this day. You know, so I just, um, I felt, and this, this, that was a mistake too, though, because JT, you could have did a little bit. You don't got to give them everything, mm. but I was too young. So 95 was my, my door opening opportunity, but I didn't play ball with giving up certain things. And I think I was kind of on my own hype <laughs> of, man, I'm independent. I'm in the Bay. Mm. But Master P said, Jay, I'm leaving the Bay. I'm moving back to New Orleans. Won't you come on this promo run with me? And back then, I just, I don't know. I was so much of a star in the Bay. I'm like, why would I want to go with Master P and Silk the Shocker, see murder in this little ass van in front of my house? Right. But it ain't a little ass van. It's a van finna take them there. But in my mind, I'm like, why would I want to be packed up in there with all them CDs and tapes they got? They want me to put mines in there, and we going to Milwaukee, we going to Chattanooga, Tennessee. What the hell is in Chattanooga, Tennessee? I mean, that's a classic story, because I remember even like <laughs> when Slim Thug signed with Pharrell and uh, Star Trek in the, in the early 2000s, it was very much like they were trying to get him to go do promo tours, 
and he's used to getting paid like I don't know what 20 30 40,000 yeah. for shows and shit down south he's huge he's like why the fuck am I going to go on tour for free for a month or two that's crazy but thinking about it now shit that level of publicity and being attached to Master P and stuff's probably got a lot of value too you know you know that that concept that concept wasn't wrong I didn't realize, like, boy, you just signed the national distribution. You can't just be thinking that the whole country going to just keep buying your tapes mm. just because they did maybe on this first couple waves. But if you want to continue getting that support, you got to go to these neighborhoods. You got to go to these cities. You got to go to these places to paint your face. These fans never going to forget when you signed that poster or when you gave them the tape or the shirt. Like, after time went by, I realized, and then I started doing it, but I had lost my motion. I had lost my my wave. But what I did was I still kept investing in projects. So I just went back to independent. Because cassette tapes and DVDs still had life all the way through from from, from 93. 2004, like it I remember when, fading. when 50 put out Get Rich or Die Trying, I remember he sold like 7 million copies or whatever, but I remember people saying he just sold 7 million copies at a time where everybody's stopping buying CDs. Because around then was when Napster came out yep, and all of a sudden players. you could burn a CD yes, and like, yes. and then, you know. By, iTunes. Yeah, and it, but it, it took a while before like the full on streaming era happened. But there was like a big lull there where everybody's pirating music, people were buying mixtapes, like all kinds of shit. But people weren't really buying CDs as much for a mm -hmm, while there. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's absolutely right. And then oh, uh, warehouse music chain took a fall. Warehouse music, um, all of those popular chain stores that used to be in the mall that had all the cassettes had all, all the, started dying off they started dying off when that started to happen i i seen a shift um i seen the shift happening and um being independent started actually started to get a little harder now mm. yeah it started to get a little harder by i wouldn't say dvd stopped because even in 2010, they were still doing DVDs in Atlanta, but they had record stores that I could not believe that they, they had all these places that still sold tapes, mm -hmm. or not tapes, but DVDs. And then they start adding flash flash drives with every album you want is on this flash drive. So, because um, the streets were a little slower to warm up to like computers and and shit yeah, like that, so you yeah, could still sell yeah. CDs for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By 2006, I did my first uh, digital distribution where now, JT, give us all your music. We're not going to give you a big check like priority, none of that, but we want your catalog. It was called IOTA Distribution, Independent Online Distribution Alliance. They were located in San Francisco. Uh, Twitter had began when they began. Like all these different computer software platform oriented situations. And I remember getting my first $17,000 monthly payment mm. without arguing. I didn't manufacture no tapes. I didn't manufacture nothing. I didn't do no promo. I just loaded it up. But I had so many albums that I own, all my masters, mm. that the money that started coming in monthly, now it's like for the OGs like myself from who did the driving around with tapes and CDs and all that, this is like, oh, the best feeling in the world that I just loaded up some songs and a check coming every month. Mm. I have got a check from these people ever since 2006. Then they sold it to uh, Orchard. Then Orchard sold themselves to Sony. So the, the platform just getting bigger. Uh, I network with Ghazi and Empire. Mm. Okay, some money came, coming from that. Like the YouTube check. Okay, I learned about how to get the YouTube check. So these different things are better. I think rappers are richer now mm. than when we was coming up. Like I say, 400000 a little Dirk and them ain't nothing. Mm -hmm. Or to some of the other guys who doing Gucci Man and Future. I remember paying Future 3500 for a show to come to my, do a show for me. At my birthday party. Don't jump too far ahead, though. We got to finish oh, up. I'm the sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's I'm okay. Sorry, it's okay. So I forgot. Hold on. <laughs> no, no. That's that. We got to get to the the Atlanta era. But I was talking about the concept of right. A rapper today can can come on no jumper. Right. He could have been doing songs we never heard of this guy. Nobody never heard. Of. Right. He come on no jumper. 
He got actually a great song, though. The song started catching motion. Within 90 days, this guy, same guy that has nothing going, but he got these songs. Off this one song and there's no jumper interview, he actually got a career and he's getting booked. He had 10,000 a show. Right. He getting, you know, they paying him to come here and do this and do all these different things to get five or 10 bands. He might have a $100,000 a month just in, then the next thing you know, he got a tour. He's booked for 10 shows for next month. Mm -hmm. They didn't send half the money. It's, it's, it's 20,000 a show, they didn't send 10 up front. Mm. 10 locations sent 10, you get where I'm going? Like, the opportunity now for somebody being considered just absolutely, you're nothing yet. You got talent, but you're nothing yet. Mm. And within a 90 day run, like a Ice Spice or <laughs> oh, but Sexy she is Red. out of here, yeah. Yeah, like, I, but, but, I thought but, it was a joke, and then it's real. <laughs> it's not a joke, Oh yeah, it's yeah. real money going on. No, the on. girls are running shit all of a sudden. It's, yes. it's official. On yeah. a mainstream level, on a on an undercover underground level, there's there's a shitload of examples, yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's it is wild because it's like we kind of romanticize the days of being able to print up a CD for a dollar and sell it for ten dollars or sell it to a distributor for six or seven dollars or whatever the fuck it is. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, yeah, now knowing that like like I I know rappers who have seen their monthly checks who are making ten twenty thousand dollars off streaming, and to me they're like relatively small artists you know but i'm like wow like that's that's fucking impressive that you're able to bring in a quarter million dollars a year from from your catalog listen that's exactly what's happening now now i did realize i kind of skipped a couple things okay let's go back let's go back to 99 1999 let's go back let's go back to Death Row Dismantling. Let me just start with, let me use this as an example. 1999, 1998, Master, no, 97, Master P do the movie and soundtrack, I'm about it. Right. I'm on the track. Uh, I mean, I'm on one of the songs, I'm on this project, but I'm witnessing. In 94, me and Master P watched Murder Was The Case movie, Snoop Dogg movie at my mama house. Mm -hmm. Me and Master P sitting in my room with our mouth open watching the ambulance flip over and the devil coming out and like, you know what I mean? Like we watching this like, man, we gotta make a movie. This before we even signed with Priority Records, but we sitting in the house watching this and listening to the soundtrack. And I'm like, this is phenomenal. Mm. And he like, bro, this, this the next thing, we got to do this. Not saying that we gonna do it together, but we're discussing that this the first rap movie that's like a rap movie that come with an album. Or no, you had to buy them separate. But you know what I'm saying? It's a soundtrack, but the movie ain't on in the theater, it's just a DVD. I mean, it's a VHS. Mm -hmm. And and when we signed with, with with priority, let's just say I fall off. Boom, that didn't work. All right, cool. P keep going. But we still keep interacting. Uh when when he bring me to New Orleans in 97, when he's working on this movie. I'm getting on the soundtrack. I'm doing some couple things with a couple of his artists, but I'm watching him. He putting his first movie together. I'm like, man, my money ain't like P money right now. I didn't took a L, but I, I need to make me a movie. Mm. When I'm about it came out, man, we couldn't stop watching I'm about it, man. Like we watched that thing like over and over. I'm on the soundtrack, my music. When Mac 10 pull up for the first time, that's my song that's playing, you know, representing the West Coast. That impacted me. Like, I got an area make me a movie. 98, I make a movie with a rapper named Mac Maul out the bay called Beware It O's. It shot on 16 millimeter. It took me some months to get it done. No script. I'm just making it up, but I'm paying for these cameras, lights and sound and all of this stuff. But when I dropped that, when I dropped that VHS, it it reboosted me. Because now I have a new product that's not music. It's mm. not a DVD. It's not a cassette. But it stands out a lot because it's not the many people that are doing that at the Ain't time. Ain't nobody right? in the yeah. Bay got no movie at this time. Only movie we watching is Master P, I'm about it. Then JT come with that. Mm. I lost the music side. I regained the buzz by doing this movie. What about Cash Money Baller Blocking? Baller Blocking came out in the 2000s. Those, okay, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is the 90s. You yeah. feel me? Okay. So, so this before it was popular. Man... Daz Dillinger, Corrupt, Snoop, they all had a disagreement, whatever we should. 
they kind of doing their own thing. Daz Dillinger ended up coming to the Bay, but he was still kind of under Dev Row, mm -hmm. not for sure, you know, which way he finna go. I introduced Daz Dillinger into the independent game, like, bro, you don't even need Suge, and I don't care if you did sign. These record stores and distributors will buy your stuff right now. You gotta, let's make us an album together. Let's make an album. And let's let's put a let's let's I got somebody that'll cash us out for it right now. Mm -hmm. So dad's like, come on. So we record 12 songs in one night, and this dude pull up the next day. He finna give us 50 bands to buy a pack from us. And when dad's got that money, he needed it. And I needed it too. We split it right there. Mm -hmm. We made another album. The first album called Long Beach to Film Mode. The next album, we do it within like a couple of days called Game for Sale, and then we put a DVD with it. This is 1999. So 98, I dropped the movie, Beware of Those. 99, I hook up with Daz, and we do the two projects in the, in the VHS, and it was a DVD that came with it. And then uh, 2000, we pushing it. Then Juvenile fall out with cash money. Mm. I call Juvenile, or somebody put us together, I fly to Atlanta. This is 2001. So after I finished with Daz, Juvenile was hearing about what me and Daz did, because Daz still considered a major artist, but he got a whole album with an independent guy named JT, and we killing the market. Right. Me and, me and Juvenile end up doing the same thing. When he kind of had some issues with Birdman and Spent Off, we end up recording a project. I end up moving on this bus with him, touring with him for about a year. I come back from that. And in February 2002, I meet the rapper The Game. Mm. Before we get into that, why why did you become JT the bigger figure? Very notable name. Like when you're looking through a track list, it just really stands out to you. JT the bigger figure, I didn't even name myself. Mm. I, I definitely had the JT for my initials. I was thinking about what could I put with that? Because as coming out as a rap artist, you just can't have two letters. Mm. And I, I told my, you know, I was talking with different people, like, and everybody giving me their ideas. But one of my big homies, his name, Timothy Washington, shout out to Tim. He said, if I was you, I'd call myself JT the bigger figure. Because back in the days, all the OGs who had money, they always would be popping that, I'm a bigger figure. We, you know, they, that was <laughs> a up, term. Man? That was a term in film mode. So when he was like, if I was you, I'd call myself JT the bigger figure. Because, mm. boy, that's, that, that sound like that's it. I was like, you know what? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like it. Yeah. All right, here's another question. I know a lot of guys from Northern California, they like to make the pounds move. Throughout all these years, were you keeping your nose clean or were you still <laughs> dibbling and dabbling? Do you know, to be very, very, very honest, man, I think I grabbed some pounds a couple times. Mm-hmm. And I could literally say I never had motion with that because the profit span mm. of pounds in the Bay Area, it was like it's, it's it could be profitable, but I never wanted to constant. I didn't want to be seen like a drug dealer or mm. nothing like that. Because I was like, they know me as JT, the young genius, the CEO, the producer, the artist, the director, the actor. Like, I got the name for that. So then if I be seen like I'm selling weed or something, that just mess my whole, cause I want I want to be known as the independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm an independent tycoon. Even when I go for broke, even when I take a fall, I gotta bounce back. I got a 30 year run. Do you know the determination it takes to even want to still be sitting in the place right now doing an interview after 30 years in this rap game? Right. You know what I mean? Because I made my mind up. So the pounds, I gotta I gotta keep it real. If if I needed a few dollars, because time to times, you know, there might be some dry moments. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. It's a couple dry moments. <laughs> hey, Fig, I got about four pounds, or I got this or that. Okay, let me grab them real quick. Right. But the profit that came with it, and I still got to give him his money for them pounds, I'm like, no, nah, I don't think I like this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't like this. I right. feel you. <laughs> I during like that this. time with Juvenile, just to zero in on a certain time period during this. Like, 2001, 2002. You're moving around with Juvenile. like You're witnessing him. He's at a high point in his career. He's going crazy. Are you still thinking in the back of your head, like, this is dope that I'm moving around with him, but I still need to find my thing? Because you've like done so many different things. Like I'm, I'm just wondering, like, were you still always thinking, like, I'm still looking for my big moment where I really 
set shit this on what fire. I always, this is what I always knew when I was moving around with him and anybody or whatever I'm doing. I'm creating content no matter what. Either I'm in the studio recording something that gonna pay me later because I own the master. I'm videotaping. I'm taking pictures. I'm I'm documenting my life story. I'm documenting what I'm doing. I'm assisting Juvenile at a time where he just let Birdman in them, mm. which is the big one of the biggest labels in the world for whatever they issue was. I don't know. But when I caught up with him and we connected, he like, man, I ain't with them no more. I'm independent. I got my own label, UTP Records. And shit, you spending some money with me, JT? Come on on the road, man. He had Young Buck with him. Mm, okay, this that right. era, yeah, right before see, G-Unit. See, the Young Buck in the game is crazy. I had both of them before they ever made it <laughs> to Juvenile. Cause when I mean to uh, uh to 50, Fifty Cent. Yeah. Cause when Juvenile spent off from Young Buck, he. He left him in L.A. and I was at the hotel. Juvenile was supposed to sign with Suge Knight, and that's that was like the thing that Juvenile did that made Young Buck be like, "Fuck this!" Right? But, He's but, spoken but, on that but before. This is the thing. When we was on, when I was in the bus with Juvie, I'm on his bus while he's doing dates and touring. Right? One of the stops was New York City. At this stop, Fifty Cent is the hottest guy with this new Wankster song. Right? Mm -hmm. Fifty Cent get on the bus. So I, I heard of him, but this is the pre-Dr. Dre Eminem. This is when he had he just got shot. Mm. I had the album, a bootleg version of his album, uh, Power of a Dollar, something like that. Classic. Um, but he got this new thing with these mixtapes and this one song called Wankster. And I remember he got on the bus. Wankster was going crazy right before Get Rich or Die Trying. That was kind yes, of the whole lead-up. this is the up. thing that that, that that one song is what, well, I ain't going to say that one song, but that was impactful for Eminem to even sign him and then bring him to Dr. Dre. He just had so many songs going crazy at that time, too, because yeah. he had, like, Magic Stick with Lil' Kim going crazy. No, just this, to, was, this, is, this is before. That, that, you're right. That was a little bit see, after. See, but, I'm trying to help you understand. <laughs> how did Young Buck end up with 50? Well, on this bus, when when 50 came, he had Tony Yayo and he had Lloyd Banks. Mm. Lloyd Banks was buzzing for his bars, right? Right. Juvenile had some type of interest in Lloyd Banks. And I think that offended 50, right? So when the situation come, we, we leave from New York, we come to L.A., Suge Knight trying to sign Juvenile. Mm -hmm. I think it was for like 400,000 400, advancement or something like that, right? So he's like, yeah, man, I'm finna do the deal with Suge. We hook up with Suge, Young Buck there, you know, Suge and his guys there. I'm there. I've actually got the pictures from that night. Man, the next morning, around 9 o'clock, one of Suge Peoples was knocking on my hotel room because Juvenile, he was gone. They looking for Juvenile because today the day to sign the paperwork. But he gone. So you think that's why he took off is because he was trying Listen, to duck Suge? I'm not going to lie on Juvie because I don't know. So shout out to Juvie. Legend. You know, he had his own reason. You see that Tiny Desk performance? No, I didn't see that. Oh, you got to see it. It's a sick-ass like, live performance type thing video that he did that was real viral. Uh, okay, but keep going. The next morning... The next morning, when Suge people knocked on my door, it was like kind of early. But Juvenile had already been gone. Like, his, he wasn't in his room. So Young Buck, they was next door. Skip, Wacko, you know, Juvenile mm -hmm. crew, right? A couple other guys. When Juvenile was gone, I think that's what made Buck get kind of offended in some type of way. Looking at him like he's not really down like, for bro, the team. bro, you left us. Mm. And I don't think, like, Juvie left him, like, out of fears of some gangster stuff because the night before, we was all just hanging out at the at the club, you know, we networking, we, you know, because they about to sign us, they about to do some business. Mm -hmm. The next morning, and then Buck, I seen how he was disappointed. I don't know how angry, but... They had words, you know, in the interviews, they talked about it. Well, man, you left me in California. I don't respect that. So that was his motion for the 50 Cent. And 50 Cent liked the Buck anyway. Right. But when he put Buck on that on that song, 
with Get Rich or Die Trying, then that's that's what led up to, you know, them doing whatever they doing. But I think 50 genuinely liked the young buck. It's a crime that that shit didn't work out because Welcome to Cashville, one of the best down south albums of that era for sure. But then, like, as soon as he fell out with 50, 50 really made it his mission to make, make sure, sure that nothing never, good ever happened yep, to him ever yep, again. Yep. Nah, that right there, I definitely seen that, you know. And um, it's, it's crazy, though, man, because at that time, Young Buck, I started bringing him to, to Fillmore right after that. Mm. So I start bringing, keeping him around me. Not keeping him, but we was networking. At the and, and within a few months after that, is when I found the game out here in L.A. And I put game and Young Buck on on some of the same product, mm -hmm. not knowing one day they both gonna be with Fifty Cent. Right. But just just happened to be these guys. I got them with me in Fillmore, my neighborhood, San Francisco. So how'd you find the game? I found the game February 14, two thousand two. Minister Farrakhan had gave a hip hop summit about letting artists know about the independent game and the right messages, and you know, don't let nobody hijack your industry, and you guys got to take it serious. Like it was a, a forum with him and uh, Russell Simmons to try to educate us and try to tell us, like, look, work together, come together. You know, we lost Tupac, we lost Biggie. Don't don't use your, your craft, you know, to tear each other down because there's other people behind the scenes that you don't see that's manipulating this, and you would think that you're just getting in some words. Next thing you know, you might be losing your life over mm -hmm. this rap stuff. So that was the theme and concept. And there was a, um, I think we was at the, um, Hold on. We was at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills, and within the auditorium or this big section conference room, it was 400 rappers in there, and we all waiting to go see Minister Farrakhan and Russell Simmons. So all these different guys having ciphers, different people walking around, networking. And the only rapper stood out to me was that dude, The Game. He's tall out as fuck. Out of 400 people in this room, <laughs> I said, this dude right here, this is this him for us on the West Coast for whatever reason. It just in my mind, and it came true. Before you even heard him rap. No. He was rapping. Okay. He was rapping for Trady of the East Siders, Goldie Lo Goldie Lokes uh, from the uh, East Siders. Um, I think it was. Somebody from the Outlaws was there. Basically, it was a couple rappers, and he was just busting some bars, and they like, oh, man. And I was, he was standing here rapping for them. They right here. I'm behind him looking at him like, this dude, he sound like Shine, but he rapping like Fabulous, but his bars about Compton gangbanging. So I'm like, ooh. I need to meet him. I also feel like, well, like a, a, huge, I need to meet him. a huge percentage of the top CEOs in the world are like very tall. So I just say that, like, I'm always going to bet on the tall guy. The and tall he's, guy. He's tall as fuck. <laughs> and he also has, like, a very distinct face, which I think is, like, an important thing for a rapper, like, to, in terms of people remembering them. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, his voice and his delivery and everything. Look, I said, this the next guy for the West Coast. I introduced myself. He said, I know exactly who you are. I, I got you in Dad's tape. I see what you did with Dad's. I see what you did with Juvenile. I'm like, bro. I want to bring you back to Filmo, and I want to put you in the studio to record, to record, and see what we could do independent. I ain't making no promises. I could do nothing big for you, but what I can offer you is the independent game, and I help market and promote you because I feel like, boy, you somebody I want to work with. Mm -hmm. He didn't have no demo before, no motion, no promo, no manager, no nothing. When I flew him up to Filmo, but this is before he got shot, right? This after he got shot. This is after, okay. Yes. This Because that's how he tells the story in the music he and everything. He tells the story without JT. If none of his stories, yeah, yeah. my name don't ever come up, but that's for a reason. Man, I got to bury you because my intention was just to use you. My intention that we was going to really be linked up. Mm. But that's another story. Okay. The, the concept of Black Wall Street, I got from Minister Farrakhan at that meeting mm -hmm. where he said, do you know we had a poor neighborhood called Black Wall Street right. in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Do, do you know they were kicked out of the good part of the city 
and forced to go to another part of the city mm. where there was a population of uh, the native indigenous people from America, the, the natives. And this is such a well-known story now that people talk about all the yes. fucking time. So that's kind of crazy that that is how this all came together. Yeah. And and the concept was they over here in this place that looks like nothing, mm -hmm. but they mess around, discover some oil, discover some benefits, and they started, the poor people just start spending a little bit of money they had with each other so that the dollar would circulate amongst mm -hmm the poor black community so many times where before it go to the white community that might have been oppressing them at the time, they like, well, we might got to do it ourselves. They messed around and did so good, they became a thriving area. Mm -hmm. And he was making a comparison to how did Black Wall Street become successful and what do you guys need to do to become successful? Because everything is not going to come from a major label. Some of these things you're going to have to do yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's when it clicked into me. Damn, Black Wall Street. I need to make this new movement, Black Wall Street. And I started the Black Wall Street movement. And my first artist was a rapper named The Game. I put out a CEO manual that you could find online right now. Black JT the Bigger Figure presents Black Wall Street CEO manual. And in this manual, it talks about how I was able to do all these things independent. And I remember I was charging $100 for these because I only made limited uh, amount of them. Then I made it PDF. But in the book, I got game when I first meet him and all how I discovered this rap, this new rapper called The Game. By me doing a mixtape with Game and Nas had some unreleased songs that I got from one of my people. I said, let me blend Game with Nas, and me and Daz did Long Beach to Filmo. Let me make a mixtape and call it QB to Compton. At the same time, Jay-Z and Nas is going at it. He just dropped Ether, and, and, and when Ether dropped, I dropped QB to Compton. So it made it like Game was connected with, with Nas, but that was me. Game mm -hmm. didn't know Nas. I'm the one architect that, and that's how he ended up with his deal with Dr. Dre off that mixtape. Wow. But as you know the story, he don't give Fig no credit. But no. how did how did he end up pushing you out of his because career? Because I didn't I never I never tried to sign him as 360 deal, you my artist up under me. I signed him based on these songs I'm paying for. That's okay. what I'm executive producer of. Whatever you get on your own, do your thing. Is that a regret? Because that was your nope, hustle at that time, nope, right? No, nope, because that's a 360 deal, and I didn't never want nobody to say that I'm trying to be on a part of them mm. and whatever they got going. It would have been nice. But to this very day, I still get paid off the original songs that I paid for. I done made over five million off of this over the lifetime of this. So he might have made 50 million. But if I made 10%, I'm happy with that. Why? I'm infamous in your career. I'm not famous for, for what me and you done. I'm infamous because the public know. Man, your first tape, JT dropped a, 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 the the untold story, a month and some, two months for you dropped with Dr. Dre. How did that happen? Because JT owned the Masters and he came, he couldn't stop it. Right. Okay. Because so I remember that. Yes. I remember like being such a game fan that buying I, it anyway. Well, but that I had to like download the music that he put out before his G Unit era, and mm -hmm. so I think that might have been maybe the first time I really got familiar with you and shit it was back then. But so you were you were selling a shitload of uh, stuff just from people that were hardcore fans that were just trying they to buying it because yeah. in the truth they like this voice don't sound like the new voice. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. This don't sound like this, but this is classic error. 2002, pre-Dr. Dre, pre, you know, I didn't see no bullet holes in his body to get shot in the heart. So let's <laughs> just keep it real. Really? I got shot. Holy you can see, shit. Yeah, chopper bullets. Like this shit for real. How many hit you? Three. What year was that? 2017, we'll get oh, to Oh, we'll get to that, okay. Yeah, okay. nah, but I'm saying, if you get an operation on your heart, you gonna have a scar down your body. That man, and this ain't to bash game. See, one thing, they don't have no public record of me bashing him like, oh, he did me wrong. Nope, JT a real grinder. JT wouldn't sold his own. He ain't doing no crime about not being part of another man's success. Mm -hmm. But the way that they marketed him, I got shot. I was at the, you know, I'm a gang member, but the guy I met, it wasn't none of that. What, you didn't take him to be a gangbanger? 
No, I heard him rapping about it, but okay. the true story, he told me that, hey, man, you know, I live on Santana Block, which is Crips, mm -hmm. but when he came out rapping, it's Bloods because Big Face was the real blood, okay? The real uh, stepper with the with the with with their campaign for the blood, you know, movement. Game is his, his real biological brother, so the deal made sense. But Game, when I met him, he was telling me about sports. He was telling me about stripping. He was telling me about <laughs> being over here. You just mean that game show that he was on? Nah, like something about stripping, game show. Listen, I don't know the, the details. Because that used to be something <laughs> that people would about always about throw it. at him, but it, I always took it that it, he never really stripped. He just had that little thing on the game show, right? I mean, to be honest, that's what I'm saying. Like, he was more of... I feel like if he stripped, he we would know by now. You know what? That's the part. But maybe not. He had a Hershey's. Okay, that's because I'm just, you know, the what, original tattoo? Picture, the, the original photo shoot right now of Game, and I can show it to you right here. It was a Hershey's kiss melting. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm keeping, I'm keeping, listen, this ain't no mark to you, Game, brother. <laughs> hey, brother, the ladies love you, man. Listen, mm. it's a Hershey's kiss. Tilted over, <laughs> dri dripping. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> listen, listen. I know. I think Easy E covering it now, but I'm just saying the original picture. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that that would kind of make sense because he he kind of does have a history of being a little impulsive with the tattoos because oh, he got the butterfly and then he got it covered oh, up. Man, Adam, your face. You like dripping? What? No, I mean, I'm saying though, but now listen. Now that's a that's a viral moment right there. I'm just saying. <laughs> now nah, real talk. Shout out to Game though, man. The ladies love him. But the guy that I met was more like a guy who went to school. Uh -huh. He sp he spoke on sports. He said he had some family issues. He say you know uh, he had some um, you know foster home. So I you know I related to I related to his pain. Like I didn't think nothing bad of it. Like it's okay if you're not the toughest guy. But once he got the deal, though, that's when I start to see, like, wait a minute. I none of these bloods was with you when, when I had you. Mm. Or no, these guys wasn't promoting you when I had you. When Dr. Dre and them guys, now you got them. So I felt a certain way, like, oh, okay. He want to make it like I wasn't nothing, but I'm the guy that got your motion going. And I think that kind of, the way he did me, is the same way he tried to do 50 Cent. Now, let me tell you what that is. Mm. He was signed to, to Dr. Dre, I think, in the 2003. I had game 2000, February 2002. But 2002, 2003, I'm promoting game through the mixtapes and through the independent circuit. I'm paying for the Double XL uh, magazine ads and all these different things. Mm -hmm. So I'm just continuing to invest into a product that I have on my label. But those songs are the songs that Aftermath eventually signed him to. But then once they signed him, he didn't produce, I guess, enough songs for Dr. Dre to activate his own thing with Game. But 50 Cent gave him a chance and put the extra stamp and allowed him to come into the G-Unit family. And that right there is what boosted it and activated his own album to actually be coming out. Right. So I seen the way he did 50, the way he did 50 Cent is that the people told him, you better than 50. Mm. You more gangster than 50. Because there was a moment in time there around the time the documentary came out where it very much was like it just seemed like the game was like surging past fifty, and and it was because he had hot ass songs like "Hate It or Love It," and you know fifty was like maybe not going crazy with new music at that time, and that yeah, that definitely did feel like it was a big part of that. He, I think he caved into the pressure of man, you don't need him, man. It's the West Coast, man. You you like fifty, but what fifty had that game didn't have was the business knowledge. Mm. See, Game had the opportunity, but while he had the power, I mean, imagine this. Imagine falling out with the guy that wrote half your songs on your project. <laughs> like a couple months after they, they come out. Like literally, <laughs> his album, I think, came out January 2000, two, 2000, what, five maybe? And within 30 days, 
they having a dispute in New York where somebody got shot or something at yeah. the radio station. And I'm like, what the hell? And then next thing you know, they had some type of meeting with Russell Simmons and they act like they hugging <laughs> or something. That. And then next thing, then right after that, G U not fuck fifty, pop, 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 pop. But history that repeats itself crazy. because then remember like Jay Prince making Drake and Kanye do a fake ass patch it up? Yeah. That's like the same exact thing. <laughs> like the old head that you can't say no to comes to you and like makes you squash your beef, but it's bullshit. But you know what though? <laughs> Universal Records is powerful. Universal Records is powerful. Right. Right? So 50 Cent and Game having a dispute is like a Tupac Biggie, re like something similar right. could probably happen from that. And the, the people about the money like, hold on, no, no, no. Mm. So when Dre was trying to give Game the game about, bro, squash that, fall back, you know, let's get the money, this teamwork. Game, uh, once he bucked Dr. Dre, he bucked Jimmy Iovine, he bucked 50, and he like, nigga, I'm the voice, I'm the face. That right there, I think, was something that um, the fans liked it because it was like the rebellious, the bad boy, the tough guy, you know, on Black Wall Street. But ultimately, when you're signed to the person that you're, you're rebelling against. The yes. Because remember, it took forever yes. for a second album to come yes. out. Yes, because they had to figure out. And uh, Interscope ended up <clears throat> putting it out up under, what's the other company that's over there? Oh, fuck. I can't remember. The other, but... the other label that put that out. Right. It, it wasn't yeah, Interscope, and it wasn't either. Aftermath. It was the other arm. Right. Okay. I mean, he still ended up having a pretty good career, but for sure, it, it sucks when you think about it. It's like the egos involved stop something that could have been so crazy because if you had Game, Young Buck, 50, Lloyd Banks, and all Yeo together. all together really actually putting all differences to the side, if we had even got monsters. like a five-year run of that – it would have resulted in some of the craziest music that we'll never get to hear, you know? Man. When I seen that, I said, oh, he did the same thing that he did to me, except I just didn't say nothing. I'm like, shit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put the music out. <laughs> mm. You know? Because you dropped an album like the same day that the documentary came out, right? Come on now. I'm, Someone I'm, was I'm, telling me the story. Yes. I put out the album, Untold Story, without a documentary. When I found out he named his album the documentary, I put out the Untold Story documentary <laughs> with a DVD with it, man. And I cashed out. Listen, man, listen. I, I, I play chess, man. Like, I seen the play. I'm like, well, shit, I ain't never finna be part of that. I might as well cook up my pack because that's legal. That's my genius. Document. That's kind of like story. evil. That's like villain shit. I did it. <laughs> and he was mad as hell, too, boy. Shout out to Game, man. And shout out to Jimmy Henchman. See, Jimmy, <laughs> let me tell you about Jimmy yeah, Henchman. What's your history with him? Before I released this, I was in pursuit. I came to Aftermath to sell the album, my masters, my video footage, my Pro Tools sessions with Game. All I wanted was 250000 as a flat rate, and I'm going to go on about my business. Mm hmm. Because I know this y'all new star. I'm not trying to rock the boat. When I went in Dr. Dre office on his 40 something birthday, I'll never forget because he, he had left and left his assistant. She wanted to see the copies of my, my uh, legal paperwork and she was trying to get a copy to take it in the office so they can make a copy of my contract and all my stuff. My lawyer said, let them see it, but don't give it to them. Let them look at it, don't give it to them. When she read that paperwork, she said, baby, you got them. But we're going to pass on the 250 but we're going to contact the management and see, you know, if they want to do it. And Game texts me. Man, you at the office, man, trying to mess up my deal, man. Man, I got 75000 for you, man. And give me all that stuff, and then you just go away. I say, brother, I'm not selling this for 75000 I want 250000 I'm going to get that, too. I'm going to make it either way, bro. Mm. So you might as well go on and authorize it. He like, man, man, I ain't taking that out of my budget to give to you. I'm like, man... You over here because of me. But that's all right. I told him, all right, thank you. I called Young Buck. He put me on the phone with 50 Cent. Bro, I want to sell this, you know, these masters because I know y'all about to do it. He said, bro, man, do your thing, bro. We're going to do what we're going to do anyway, but that's your shit, man. Go get your money. Boom. So game turned me down. 50 Cent turned me down. Dr. Drainham turned me down. I said, well, shit, I'm going. I start shopping around. I end up at Koch. Hmm. At Koch. They gave me a hundred thousand. Then I said, I just want to sell it for two hundred and fifty more thousand. I'm gonna go. 
the album was was doing numbers, but I knew they are gonna come with a lawsuit and freeze the money. Let me get what I can get now because a lawsuit finna come to try to stop me. And once a lawsuit come, it freezes all income that come to. Right. The, so I'm like, uh uh-uh. uh. So they like, oh, all that's all you want. That's all you want. I said, that's all I want. Man, Harry up and cut his check. Cause I still had one more album. I went and sold to Navarre <laughs> and did another deal for another album called West Coast Resurrection. <laughs> I listen off my masters. I'm like, I'm finna run me up a meal ticket. And was this basically just like whatever ass songs that he happened to record while you were there? It was everything he recorded. It was just so anything and, and nothing got, yeah. is whatever. It's, <laughs> this is all deliberate. Right. <laughs> this is a deliberate project. But probably not stuff that he would have chose to ever release. He probably, nah, hell yeah. no, nah, not at that time. Right. With Kanye West, oh, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Dre, Eminem, no way possible. But for me as a investor, yeah. no, this is, this is a gold mine for me right now. Yeah. So, um, Jimmy Henchman somehow. Jimmy but. Henchman. Okay. When I left, when I left Aftermath and talked to 50, then I got the call from Jimmy Henchman. Mm-hmm. But Jimmy Henchman didn't call and say, hey, my brother, you know, uh, let's negotiate. Let's he say, hey, homie, this Jimmy Henchman, man, this game manager. I'm like, oh, okay, what's up? Yeah, man, um, <clears throat> I've been told, <laughs> listen, listen to the gangs and talk. I've been told you got some uh, unreleased materials, man, that you shopping around, man. I don't think that'll be good for you, man, to do that, man. You know, we we got motion right now, and well, he didn't say motion. But <laughs> that's said, new slang, yeah. yeah but. <laughs> he, he, he he said something else. We we got some big things that's bigger than you, bro, and like you need to really stand down, bro. And I say, look here, bro. I respect you as who you are and you as manager, but this my shit, homie. You can't even call me, impress me about mine. He like, man, if you try to put that stuff out, man, you're going to have a whole nother set of problems. I just want to tell you. I say, bro, I don't care. Nothing about no problems, man. I'm starving right now, nigga. And I'm from the Bay. And I'm from Fillmore. Boy, I'm putting this shit out. <laughs> so whatever y'all going to do, then somebody else hit me like, this such and such, the big blood. I say, man, <laughs> salute to you too, brother. You know, uh, but... My family's hungry up here, and right now y'all done got the millions and all that. You know, you on MTV and all. I'm putting this out my will without your permission. You were saying that, but were you deep down I inside? Were you that. a little scared? Nope, because I'm like, man, I'm starving for real. Boy, they're going to mm. have to shoot me and kill me about these albums because, boy, I'm from Fillmore. And then some of my <laughs> partners gave me 10 bands and 20 bands to promote it. They're like, Fee, you can't go out. Mm. You can't go out. So Jimmy Henchman called back. Uh, a few days before, he said, I heard you got the deal. Such as I hung the phone up because I'm like, shit, if I talk to him, that's going to make this probably worse. So let me just hang up in his face. Like, I ain't listening. <laughs> I didn't get your message, homie. And I put that shit out. So, yeah, man, Jimmy Henchman, man. Uh, you know, that, that gangster shit works sometimes. But when you got a black man hungry and he got a few dollars he owed to his hood, mm. my hood gave me a few extra racks because I don't sell dope. When I needed to pay for them ads and promo, that was some of the people in my hood. So when I came home with that half a ticket, uh, uh, doing the deal here and doing the deal there, and then next thing you know, I got another two, three hundred. I was able to feed my hood, look out for my people, and whether game ever came to see me or salute me ever again, I'm part of your history regardless. Not that I was trying to be, but I paid the money, so I'm part of it because mm. I did it deliberately. You, so why do you think, like, on his Drink Champs interview that he downplays your role just because he doesn't like you? Because he don't want me to get no credit, but mm. I'm like, that's what make me infamous because I won't come on here and bash him. Right. Hey, brother, you, you did your thing, but look at your position now. Imagine that you come from JT, one of the coldest independent CEOs, you get the biggest deal and and use the name that I started. I'm thinking we're going to interact. You register the name and go on like it was your thing. Mm. Okay. You didn't put out not one artist from the West Coast that got a chance to, to grow off your tree. You kept the tree to yourself. You the only branch on your tree. R.I.P. the billboard, the rapper that I guess he was going to do something with right. that got killed. But you can't find one rapper that you helped take flight. That is not my legacy. That's your legacy. You had the biggest, you had the whole West Coast behind you. You had the South and the East Coast. And the attitude that he brought to the table, he carved out his own bid that I'm learning from to this day. Man, when God bless you to get on top, man, don't shit on the people that helped you get there because you don't know. You might be cutting your feet off. 
That is like, that is kind of surprising because it's like every rapper always has at least like one or two guys that they try to push alongside him along the way. And yeah, I guess he did, he didn't really do too much of that, huh? Because it was like it's me. I, I get the I'm feeling. The best. Yeah, my, from my time even talking to him, you get the feeling that he is someone who seems like he's kind of okay being alone. That he's very much his own person and he's focused on his own mission. This is a lot of stuff people say about me too. That he's not, you know, necessarily like a people person. He's kind of just in his own world, whatever his mood is. You know what? When you selfish, and I can't say that's what it is, but that's just what it looks like. Mm. You can't. You didn't help not one guy. I mean, come on, it ain't that hard to add some guys to your to your album and help promote them. Mm. If, especially you a label, you Black Wall Street, right? Where's a rapper at? Mm. Where's somebody at? You could have signed any other dope rapper in America would have signed with game. Somebody who's not on yet would have had no problem. Mm. But he never, I don't think, offered it. But that's his own mission, though. Like you say, you know, that's every man got their own way they want to do it. Mm -hmm. But imagine being a tree. And you the only branch. That's that's how you got to look at it. See, you got Snoop, you got the dog pound though. You, you love the dog pound. You know corrupt. You know you mm -hmm. know you know dads. You know uh, other artists that he helped the the uh, the East Siders. We would have probably never knew them, but he helped kick that off. Mm -hmm. That don't mean he got to Snoop. Don't got to keep on babysitting an artist that he helped. Even me, he helped me do shit. But he don't gotta keep on helping. Like if I give you a boost, boy, you better get up, mm. make some shake. You think you'll ever uh, reconcile with the game? You think you'll ever have a conversation with him again? I don't think that we enemies. I actually hit him a couple times, and he didn't hit me back. On but Instagram when, or where? On Instagram. But look, I seen him at the hip hop, uh, at the hip hop, or the gang truce or something with him and Snoop had going on. Mm. Um, and when I came. He seen me, him and Wack was walking behind me. He tapped me like, what's up, man? Come on, bro, come over here, holla at me. We went and talked for a minute. <clears throat> we took a picture. And what year is this? This is 2016. Okay. And we took a picture, and I ended up on the front of a magazine with the gang. And they thought I was a crip, and he was a blood, and we was joining forces. So whoever wrote the article for some reason, because I was there with the Crips and Bloods. Were you wearing they, blue? I, I don't nope. I was nope. I had on a white <laughs> t-shirt. But like the caption with like you and him he was like Crips, Crips and, and Bloods, Bloods come, joined together. And it's me and him on the front cover. <laughs> Bro, listen, wow. you could Google that picture right now. I can't think of the that name of the amazing. magazine. What is it? Uh fucking uh and it Don, came out, Don Diva or some shit? Nope. Um it was Murder a, Dog. It was something that came up out of Atlanta. Whoever the magazine was, they was there. So they just like, Crips and Bloods come together. <laughs> That's hilarious. But what was that conversation like? Was That was the last time you talked to him? That's the last time we was in, in each other present. And it was peaceful and it was like love. Like, you know, shit, let's link. I ain't tripping. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it wasn't like, see, I think he still look at me like I'm just a, a little dude up under him. But I always know, nah, I, I help give birth to you, boy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like. That was JT marketing plan to put you with Nas. Right. You didn't know Nas. That was my genius. But I don't get the credit, but I don't have to because it's written in stone. Right. Well, you can't fake it. Part of the record now. Yeah, it's part of the record. It's part like of the resume. A lot of people are going to be talking about it from this. Come on. Um, straight up. Okay. So just just this is just a random name, but what was your relationship with Tupac? There was something about a fight at one point, right? Okay. I'm a Tupac fan first and foremost. Let me make sure. You got to be. Love Tupac. Got it. But my introduction to Tupac was 1991. Um, he did a song with a rapper from Oakland named The Governor, The Gov. Mm -hmm. Shout out to The Gov. And he did a song. And on that song was another rapper from Oakland, East Oakland, Richie Rich. Shout out to Richie Rich, too. But at this time in 91, Richie Rich, grandma or family member lived in Fillmore on Central Street. And when he come to his family house, some of my people from Fillmore chased him while he was in his cougar. A cougar, candy paint, gold ones. You know, of course, in any neighborhood, you see a car like that. So some of the guys, that that's what they do. They tried to get him. Well, he put it in the song that he rapped on with Tupac and Gov. 
the situation happened in 90, so I was locked up in 90. I got out in 91. Um, the Gov put that put that um that uh, EP out called The Governor's Taxing, featuring Tupac and Richie Rich, and he had some other songs. That came out in 91. <clears throat> they got a club on Broadway that was popular for concerts. And at this, at this, at this, at this time, they booked Richie Rich, the governor, and Tupac to come and perform. At this performance, we came to the performance to get Richie Rich. Because he said, I got some broke ass film on niggas trying to jack me for my gold tones on this mm. song with Tupac and Gub. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was personal. It was more or less like, man, this nigga dissed us on this hot ass song with Tupac. <laughs> man, and they got a show up the street from Filmo tonight. Right. So we go to the show. We let them get into it. We was waiting for that song to come on. As soon as that song come on, niggas rush the stage. While we rushing the stage, Tupac grabbed the mic stand and he swinging that thing. Good. Everybody swing. Everybody fighting. None, none of them was punks. But we it was more of us than them. So we overpowered them. Tupac, he took some blows. He got his jury took. My people got the jury, you know, um, and it wasn't really personal. You know what I mean? He fought back hard. Was he, Tupac just a regular guy to you at this time? Hell no, nah, this is Tupac the rapper, but, the movie star. I, but I thought you were talking about like 1991. 91, he was still a star. Really? 91? Okay. 91, yeah. Tupac was big to us. Now, he wasn't the mega star. Right, okay. But he was still a star. He had some music out. Okay. Sorry to my hip-hop historians. Fucking the timeline nah, up a little all, bit. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so, so that's my introduction of physically being there. I physically didn't get to take nothing. I physically probably got hit with the with the uh, <laughs> mic stand because there was some hitting too. Right. We took some because we climbing up onto the stage. Mm -hmm. But they had some guys too. You know what I mean? So that's my introduction. When they say, oh, JT and them just jumped Tupac, nah, that didn't happen like that. Or oh, JT and them robbed, nah, that's not the story. He just happened to be with the wrong guy at the wrong time, so right. he took his ill. So what happens to the jewelry? Because these days, obviously, it does like an iPhone tour around like various neighborhoods the and shit. The jewelry is sitting in the hands of a man that don't care nothing about clout. Still to this day? To this day. But he's keeping it because it's a piece of history, because it came from Tupac? Because he the one got it. Really? So the guy who took it still has it? He still got it. Really? Yes. And he never considered he trying to care about him. Even though I've seen they had something about selling the ring to Drake for a million oh, and all that, yeah. he might pop out with it because he got the pictures that night with Tupac wearing it. Wow. And then now he got the pictures of him having it. That's actually insane to think that jewelry could be worth so much more just because a rapper owned it at one point. Like yes. they're like a king or a queen or yes, some shit. Man. But it makes nah, sense, yeah. Nah. But then my next interaction with Tupac is that the video shoot for Ray Love uh, last night, Tupac the director, ghetto thing for Mac Maul, Tupac directed and starred in both of these, and it was in Los Angeles. And <clears throat> that was 1995. I remember my uncle drove me down here because Layla Steinberg was Tupac's manager too mm -hmm. before. But now she's manager of Ray Love and Mac Maul, so she the one call me say, JT. You need to come to LA. We doing Tupac is directing both of these videos, and I, you know, we want you to be part of that. Shout out to uh, Layla Steinberg and uh, uh, Kyrie, CEO and producer of Young Black Brother. Mm. So I come down there. <clears throat> At first, I wasn't really tripping about what we did because that was four years ago. It's, it's nothing. Nah, it's still kind of something, but it's the way I pay for it. We doing the video, or he's directing the video. I'm just doing the scenes that I'm part of. I'm part, you know, I'm right there. So we're not talking to nothing yet. During one of the breaks, um, we both end up in the same, in the RV where pretty much everybody else got off, and he had his ounce of weed that he rolling these blunts back to back, and he's smoking, and it's looking like he's stressed about something, right? So when he passed me the blunt, we talking, but his stress coming from his case or his situation in New York. And when we talk, 
the conversation about what happened in Frisco is like, you know, bro, uh, I salute you, you know, everything. You know, I'm talking with him. I salute you, bro, everything, man, nigga, you know, it's love, you feel me? I know that little shit happened. He like, man, that's the past, homie. Right? He had bigger fish to fry at the moment. Yeah, but I'm just was trying to make sure that I said something because now I'm an artist mm. in the game. At that time, I wasn't an artist yet. Okay. So now I'm an artist, so I'm trying to make sure that, you know, we good, right? So the outlaws come back on, or not the outlaws, they was called the thug life, I think. Yeah, they oh, was yeah, thug yeah. life. They come back on the bus, they deep. Now that's know. somebody who put on a lot of his homies. Yes. Tupac yes. was not worried about yes. that at all. Yes. That um that that conversation faded, you know. So I felt good. Like, you know, at this time they had them chip phones. Mm. Them burning phones where you could buy it and stay on for six months and all that type of stuff. So I had two phones. I asked somebody for a charger to plug it up. That was that was from his group, Thug Life. Mm -hmm. So I plugged my phones up. Then I needed something from the gas station or the store or something. Somebody said, I'm going to the store. So I leave my two phones here, go to the store. When I come back, my um, both my phones is gone. So I'm like, hey, bro, uh, what, anybody seen where them phones was right here? Like, no, I ain't seen no phones. And Tupac was laughing. So I don't know to this day. When I kept asking for my phones, nobody never... They just kept smoking and kept talking. Cause I'm like, so I can't really like make no scene, but I'm like, bro, did these niggas just steal my phones, bro? They the only ones on the bus. <laughs> but you think it was like quiet retribution for the chain? I think so. Cause like how do my phones, and they was burning out burnouts, but I'm still like, man, bro, I'm asking these niggas, and they like, nah, I ain't seen no phones. So y'all, the same people who sitting here when I went to the gas station, come back and now y'all ain't seen the phones? Right. And when I came in and Pac had the little smirk on his face, he never been like, hey, y'all, where his phone was at? He didn't say nothing. He just kind of like had the little smirk and kept on rolling the smoke. And I'm like, I just walked off the bus. I'm like, I got played like a sucker, bro. They didn't took my two phones. That's the last time you ever saw him? That's the last time. Wow. That's the last time. You got time. memories of how it shook the fucking world when he, when he passed? Yes, because soon as after that video shoot, two weeks later, Tupac Shakur shot at Quad Studios. Wow, okay. I felt a certain kind of way. Two weeks later. <laughs> you yep. felt like I felt a you. certain kind. No, 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 no. Not oh, in okay. the I felt bad for him. Okay. Cause he already going to court for the the, the girl and then get mm. shot. So it's like, damn, he going to court. Then come to find out, supposedly, allegedly, whoever had something to do with the shooting had something to do with sending the girl to, to do the fake little rape thing. That's true. I mean, allegedly. The, oh, okay. Yeah, you know. I know Vlad ended he up. He said something about it. Vlad ended up interviewing the girl from that situation. I don't think Did I, she confess? Or did she say he did it or didn't do I it? I don't know if I ever actually ended up watching it, but I always thought it was pretty crazy that he got that interview. But, damn, okay. So there wasn't any part of you that was, like, angry at him for the fucking phone situation? Nah, I'm saying they nonchalantly, like, ain't no phone. It never was no phone shit. Right. Ain't no Court, no, no charge. The charger gone. The phone's gone. I don't, it's no evidence that I that there ever was two phones sitting here. <laughs> right. Yeah. So when he starts smirking, I, I'm like, he act like he's probably squashed it, but I don't think he mm -hmm. did it. But I think he green lighted somebody with that. Hey, bro, who phones it? Man, that's that nigga. Man, that Frisco nigga. Film on him. <laughs> man, go and take them phones, man. Right. Yeah. So crazy. Yeah. But I mean, shit. To be honest with you, I was like, shit. That's how I go though. Mm. It come, it come with this, it, you know. And to throw this situation in there, I remember since we did that to him, that was ninety one, ninety two. A year later, I get booked through my homeboy. He he go rent the Richmond Auditorium. He booked Master P mm. and some Richmond rappers. He booked some Hunters Point, RBL, JT the Bigger Fix. So he, now he got all this collaboration finna happen. Somebody from Hunters Point did something to somebody from Richmond in some type of way of they felt disrespected. So they got a few of their homies and ran the Hunters Point dudes up out of there. I think they were from Oakdale and they was tripping some rappers. I can't think of their name, but they was uh, they came in Richmond like tripping about some Hunters Point tripping, right? So 
RBL Posse, I think they got up out of there just because it started not looking safe because this is mostly Richmond people. We from Frisco. Mm. So when I go on stage, all I can remember hearing was projects, projects. They coming down the aisles and they got the chairs in their hands and they commenced to stomping on us and beating us good. Shout out to Master P and them, man. They put a good beating on us. <laughs> they put a, they put a. <laughs> and what year was this? <laughs> this 1992, bro. I was about 18. This is my first, my first album then came out. Uh, I think it's December 92. And, and, and I just remember, boy, we barely made it up out of there. Two of my homeboys ended up going to the hospital. Holy Nobody shit. died. We got outside. Boy, they were standing across the street in the, uh, behind the garbage cans, busting at the cars. I remember the car going Wait, slow. people were shooting at your, Man, at your what? tour they, buses they, or whatever? No, nah, we didn't have no tour buses. Just then. cars. We okay. just had cars. But everybody at that back, everybody at the backstage, that was us. So they just waited for us to come out. Whoever didn't get beat on the inside, we had to duck the bullets <laughs> on the outside Holy to try to get it. Man, listen, it was pure chaos. But we just had we 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 jumped Tupac and them, then we jumped Mac Dre and them. The Mac Dre situation, it wasn't like that's what we was trying to do. It was just in field mode when everybody come in our neighborhood, we want to be them niggas in in the club or the party at the time. So that was one of the names I was gonna bring up next. Was Mac Dre? Like, what? When did you first meet him? What was the origin of your? My first introduction, Mac Dre. We was jumping them niggas and they, and they was getting up out of there. <laughs> and so, where did it take place? San Francisco. Uh, downtown on Folsom Street, and a guy named Jay Diggs. Let me tell y'all about that. Let me speak on, say well, this. You're currently so, having some issues with yeah. Yeah, Jay Diggs act like he was there that night. Okay. He's telling the story about Mac Dre and them and Cool Nut and all these dudes at some concert. Jay Diggs, you're lying, boy. At this situation, it was a party only. It was on Folsom Street, not Broadway. He wasn't there, but it was somebody there. That when we start getting on Mac Dre and them, and let me tell you how it started. It was really because Mac Dre and them was fresh up in there. They had them curls and they had them jean suits on, you know, the old school <laughs> jean coat with the jean. So it was really that they were fresh. And and then my partner got into it with one of his partners, and his partner hit my man in the head with a bottle and ran out the club. And then, but when he done that, because he was gangster, he did his thing. Mac Dre and them was still right here. So they had to come through us to get out because his man just hit. So we only attacked them because of what his man did. But when we chased Mac Dre and them out of there, Jay Diggs was not there. Somebody else, we chased him down, down the uh, street where it's a dead end. They're in a minivan. But whoever that dude was who hit with the bottle, he already had the car started up. So by the time we chasing Mac Dre and them down, down to the bottom of it, he's spinning the car around and whipped out that tech boy. Shout out to Mac Dre, RP Mac Dre. Shout out to the Crest Side. Man, we seen that tech come out. Thank God he didn't shoot because we was close enough. He like, nigga, back up. Man, we start scattering because we figured they going to shoot. And this anyway. was Mac Dre's friend. Mac Dre's friend. Right. But Mac Dre is in the van, though. Right. So that situation, I just always saluted him. You know, uh, that was my introduction. Right. My next time and first time meeting him personally and physically when he got out of prison. I love how you like have all these fights with people and then you end up meeting them on like some cool shit after. <laughs> because you know when you when you young and like 18, 19, 20 like that, yeah, yeah. you kind of still, you know, that's 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 kind of okay. Like in my older years now, I would never be want to do no stupid shit like that. But when you young trying to make a name you know, for the wrong reasons. It's different now, too, with the internet, where it's like, if you get beat up by somebody, you're on his Instagram, you're figuring out exactly who he is and, like, plotting your revenge. It's yes. not like back then, it was like, you're just a dude. Like, very people, few people there yes. are even going to know your name, yes. right? But 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 this is what I seen. I said, man, being from Filmo is popular, but we popular for the bad stuff, right? Mm. And that's where I think my, my shift of changing, like, See, I don't want to be known as, like, I'm trying to be the bad guy and because my niggas with this bad guy shit, that's going to have an impact on my career. I got to fall back from this shit, and I think we need to be known for networking, and I think that's what make me want to network with so many other places because back then we used to only be like, nigga, feel more only. Fuck everybody else. Nigga, it's mm -hmm. all about us. 
Like how a lot of dudes, how a lot of dudes is now. Man, fuck the other side, nigga. This nigga, we the best thing going. Right. Yeah, that's cool, but you finna have drama, nigga, and it's gonna be blood shit like how it is today. But back then, you could jump somebody and it ain't gonna be no drive by. You could get jumped. Like I say, <clears throat> we did that to Mac Dre and Tupac in both situations. It wasn't even their fault. It was mm. somebody that was with them fault. It wasn't that they did something to provoke us. It's the nigga that's with you. So, but you said you met him again after he got out of jail. When he got out of jail, <clears throat> we met, or we was. I was at a restaurant, and he just got out of prison that day or the day before, or a couple, you know. And when we saw each other, we didn't think about none of that because he probably didn't know that was me, at the time when that happened. Right. I mean, we talked about it later, but. I I was on from doing the movies. I'm doing the promo. I got the compilation. Like, I made a lot of motion. When he went to jail, I didn't have none of this motion. So when he came home, I was JT, the bigger figure. So by me and him talking, I showed Mac Dre how to do the compilations. Mm -hmm. His first project was the uh, uh, romp, romp, romp a room lation or the romp, romp -a lation That's what it's called. We had a song called... Uh, uh, Gangsta Gumbo or Ghetto Gumbo, something like that. That's the first track on the project that was created. And I was giving him the blueprint. And Mac Dre took that knowledge, mixed with what he already knew, and just went crazy with it from there. So shout out to Mac Dre, RP, bless his God, bless his family. <laughs> Why do you think that Jay Diggs killed Mac Dre? Mac, nah, 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 nah. We're gonna clear that up. Okay. Jay Diggs didn't kill Mac Dre. Let's okay. be very clear. Like I can almost say for certain. But the benefit of Mac Dre passing at a time when Mac Dre wasn't cool with Jay Diggs, when Mac Dre was starting his own Thiz movement on his own, it was some disputes that was going on. Now, I can't say him and Jay Diggs had a specific dispute, but whatever pressure that they, whatever his team was pressure he they was putting on him, he wanted to have his own thing. So I can't say who killed who. I never. I'm sure you've watched the YouTube videos where they break it down and it's supposedly this promoter in, uh, I forget what. No, I have heard who did it and I have heard that they're gone, allegedly. Right. Now, I've heard that. You think the version that's out there publicly is basically correct, though? You know what? It's, it's multiple versions. Right. It's multiple versions. When I said what I said about Jay Diggs and Mac Dre, I say, bro, you a real snake because if you really love Mac Dre, why you didn't take care of his daughter? Why you ain't bring bus bread with his mama, even though she owned his masters? But what about all them albums you put out using Mac Dre face and name? The D is this and permit, you know, promoting this artist, this artist, that artist with Mac Dre face. Mac Dre presents. Mac Dre presents. Oh, I'm the president. A this entertainment, but you wasn't president when Mac Dre was alive. So that was something that when I went to the crest side and 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 the people seen me doing something with Jay Diggs, his people the one called me and start saying, Man, why you fucking with Diggs, bro? Why you fucking with Diggs, bro? Like up here in the crest, nigga, like everybody can't talk about it, but boy, nigga, Diggs ain't right. Man, Diggs snaked uh, uh, Dre out, but it, they didn't say killed him. It's the fact of you take a man legacy and you use a man's name and then you benefit financially and the public thinking you all this with Mac Dre face on your thing, you know what I mean? But you ain't never gave his daughter no money. Mm -hmm. You ain't never, like, his mom's straight, so let's take his mom out. How is you Mac Dre best friend and you ain't never bought his daughter a car but you didn't made all these M's off of Dre name, the world is loving you because you connected with him you know, so that is what me and his dispute started uh, because he really tried to play me, though, like use me to come be part of his video. Mm -hmm. But when I get there, it backfired because his people that's at the video, like, bro, I got to tell you something, but don't say nothing right here, bro. But it ain't right, bro. I want you to look at Mac Dre's daughter, bro, and look what she going through. And this is supposed to be his partner. Then I want to show you Mac Dre car, this brown cougar right here. Yeah, uh, Diggs left the car. At the shop, bro, oh, this man, this money, don't want to pay for this engine. So they put me up on the backstories and other parts. Then somebody called me like, Jay, 
I used to be with Mac Dre every day. Let me give you the real rundown on the last couple weeks of his life, boy. Uh -huh. It ain't what they portraying. And when I got that info, that's what made me and him start having disputes. So every chance he get, he takes shots at me. But I'm like, boy, listen, listen, listen. How is you best friends in Kansas City, a place where your best friend died, but this your, this your spot? Nah, he. I don't think he had nothing to do with 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 Dick. I mean, with Drake getting killed. No, but he's like, let me get the benefit of it though. Yeah, let you me don't get agree the with stuff he did after he passed, nigga. If you ain't took care of his daughter, let's just start right there and leave it right there. But so, what's his daughter's got like a serious issue with you, right? Did she, did she no, burn I a mean, magazine cover? She with burned her? a magazine cover because I came up there and I'm the one that told the world, hey boy. How these niggas rapping Mac Dre and they ain't never bought this girl a car, put her in an apartment, done nothing for her. When that happened, he tried to clean it up like, yeah, I'm finna do an interview and bring my niece out. But the family wasn't going for it. They're like, hell no, nah, you're not finna do no interview. I mean, he might one day. Mm. But these things is what caused her because I think, I think it hurt her too. Like I wasn't looking at it like I'm trying to hurt her. I'm saying, nah, he need to take care of you. He need to drop something on you for mm. what you going through. You know what I mean? You going through something out here, girl. You know, but it ain't my business on that level to force nobody. But since he throwing shots, I'm throwing shots back. But I'm just hitting him with facts. Hey, boy, you wasn't the president when he was alive. How you the president now? Mm -hmm. How Mac Dre love this cougar right here. If that's my best friend, I'm not finna leave his car in no shop for two, three, four, five years over a $4,500 bill for an engine that I could have paid for and had Mac Dre car on display or had it at his, give it to his daughter or at his mama house or something. But there's no way that this thing is supposed to be sitting over here dusty up under this thing. And this man now talking about he want more money for it now. Damn. Yeah, nah. So, so, so Diggs, you know, for him, he loved taking shots at me. Right. He loved always taking shots but today buddy you a real fraud boy <laughs> you ran off on mac dre family with that money boy and you always in kansas city uh oh these are my best friends ah okay yeah so that's what i think why people say he had something to do with it but i definitely want to clear j Diggs' name on anything got to do with murder of mac dre okay but the benefit and finessing the public like me and mac dre were friends and then using mac dre name for the party and the the, uh, this compilations and all that, and his daughter ain't getting no monthly nothing. Man, that shit bogus as hell, man. Right. Ain't no way, man. She should be in a new car, and her rent should be paid yearly off all the Mac Dre presents mm. finesse packages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's standing on business. Yeah. Official. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. So after the whole thing with the game doesn't work out. Uh, or whatever, like wh what's going on in your life? Like at what point do you end up going to Atlanta? Um, I want to say 2000, 2006. Okay. 2005, me and Snoop hook up. We do this magazine called Mandatory Business. We make a film project called Mandatory Business. Uh, some about, you know, bringing the hood together, helping the mamas, the babies, you know, the networking, like some positive basically. So the magazine spent off from the film that we made. By 2007, I started making films again, whole movies. I make a series called The Hidden Hand. Mm -hmm. And I do part one, part two, part three. From 2007, 2008, 2009. 2010 is when I moved to Atlanta. When I moved to Atlanta, my little brother Zay Tovin, um, one of the best producers in the world. Dope. Imagine I taught him how to make beats. Really? Imagine that one of the top producers in the world, he knew how to play keyboard from church. Right. But I taught him how to do drum programming, MPC, how to plug up a, a MIDI keyboard and work MIDI, how to run Pro Tools, so how to mix it down. And what made you move to Atlanta, though? They told him, was kept telling me, like, why is you in the Bay when the new money is in Atlanta? And how'd you know? Oh, because Zaytoven's originally from he the originally, Bay. And you just knew him out there through music or what? No, I knew Zaytoven by getting introduced to him. His family is uh, in the Army. His mom and dad or some, had something to do. So Zaytoven was born in Germany. Right. But his high school years it was in Fillmore, Galileo. So the, the, the end of his time, 1999, is when I met Zaytoven. And we recorded or, I, you know, teaching them how to work the the, the, uh, 
the equipment, because I seen he was a phenomenal keyboard player, but all you missing is how to do the drums. Right. And how to mix and how to put the, the different sounds. So once he learned that, his family moved in 2000 to Atlanta. In 2001, he sent me some product, um, and a guy named Gucci Man was on this first product. But I'm like, this is not it, Zay. Because I'm coming from California. <laughs> this new understand? thing you didn't did down south, you're like, no, JT, they like 808s. And boom, boom, boom. And they like rapping that's slower, not so much lyrical, miracle, blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. Slow. Hey, nigga, running down the street, get my money, get the, you know, the Gucci Man flow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he introduces me to this in 2001 saying, Jay, this finna be bigger than that shit out there. Uh -huh. And that was the beginning of me thinking about even going. By 2007, when I'm doing these films and I'm getting fed up, I go visit Zay 2006, 2007. Now I'm working with Gucci Man doing songs with these boys, him and uh, uh, Bankroll Fresh, R.P. Bankroll That's Fresh, base, yeah. um, Young Ralph, Mm. Uh, Love young, you know the beginning. Gorilla Zoe, these the, the the beginning of the new movement for Atlanta. Right. Um. By 2010, I'm like I'm ready, cause I'm, I'm every time I come down there, uh, OJ the Juice Man, like these dudes is just at Zay House, just walking around. They out in the parking lot, they in the backyard. All these different rappers that y'all love today, right. just was 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 new guys walking around at that time. Uh huh. And. But by 2010, I had got fed up with the bay not making no progress, and I just thought, I know all the stars from down there. My little bro, Zay, everybody is how you like, bro, just come down here. So in 2010, I go, February 1st, no, uh, September 1st, 2010. That's when you moved? That's when I moved. Okay. Uh, hold on. Then um, 2011, I kick off the magazine again. Uh -huh. to get my feet and be introduced to all the rappers and see the producers, the different DJs and all of that. So by being a magazine, I was able to get through the doors. So the whole 2011, I'm doing that. 2012, I started recording my songs. Like, shit, boy, I can't come out here and be known as just no magazine. No way possible. By, 2000, by 2013, no, New Year's New Year's Eve 2012, I switched my name to Fig Panamera. I paid Gucci Man for some songs, and I paid this rapper named Future. Before anybody knew who he was, I'm like, this the guy right here. So, so you, let me speak. You tried to do it 2 chains and just take on a new identity boy, later listen, in life I so you can two be fresh and new? Go from Titty Boy to 2 chains and get a fresh kickoff, and I followed that. Like, like he was a brand new artist. Man, listen, they didn't know who the hell Fig Panamera was because <laughs> I had to build it from scratch. So... Me and Gucci man end up doing a whole project. Were you rapping so about I, selling coke and shit? No, I'm not selling coke. I was talking <laughs> about. I was definitely talking about smoking good, okay. uh, getting money, uh, 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 being independent, busting plays. I just say that because in that era, it felt like everybody was a coke kingpin. Yep. See me, I never was <laughs> fake with my music. Okay. I talked about the scenarios or what's you know. Okay. But as far as me promoting it, like me, nope. I'm a trap boy, independent game man, JT. Nope. Big Panamera. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can hear it now. Let me now. take yeah, that. Yeah. Big Panamera. Yeah. Let me switch this. Day. They like, who the? But look, in the midst of me changing my name and doing songs, then I meet a dude named Young Thug. They like, he the weirdest guy ever. And my <laughs> partner say, Fig, get him. I say, yeah, he is kind of strange. They like, bro, that's how he is. Just, I'm telling you, work with him. Right. Man, me and Young Thug start working. We do the video. I make a movie called The Independent Gang. Then Zay told me, bring me some little dudes called the Migos. He like, man, you need to sign these dudes. But then at the point he telling me I should sign them, I'm like, shit, man, my money for Gucci man them right now. I ain't got no money. If I'm gonna spend some racks. Mm. And then, and then uh Zay, Zay was like, yeah, because they is kind of hard-headed though. Gucci man going through it. Gucci man go down had to go to prison 2013. So then when they was left as free agents, that's when Zay like, you should sign them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, my money ain't straight. Mm -hmm. So Pete ended up signing them. And then at the birthday bash concert, Drake come through the back door. Shout out to the DJ, I can't think of his name. Drake asked the DJ, who should he do a song with? Cause these little dudes had, the Migos had something going on. And Pierre, uh, Quality Control, before he got with Coach K, 
he was the executive, and he just bought them from Gucci, like bought the contract. So he like, shit, I'm putting my money behind them. So Drake said, I mean, the DJ said, you should do a song with these dudes. Man, do you know they did a song that night, Versace, Versace? Do you know the next day P paid 150000 for Nationwide promo? Do you know them boys blew up overnight? Do you know I called Zay back and said, give me a Quavo <laughs> number. Let me hear him do something with these dudes. Because I knew they was, they was cool, but I'm like, they sound like little miniature Gucci mans mm. with a different rapid flow. I mean, yeah, to be real, like, even when Versace came out, I mean, there was no guarantee that the Migos were going to be that big for that long. Like, it, it, it kind of seemed like a gimmicky thing at first, but they just kept, like, sort Listen, of reinventing. Drake, if he do something with you mm. and you pay the promo, you're going to go somewhere. Right. And then they hit him with Hannah Montana, Hannah Montana. Another song that caught that same tempo that kept it going with their own right. without Drake. But that Drake shit, oh, no. That was like the golden, that was just a super blessing for them. But P had the money. The average dude don't got no 150000 to pay for no nationwide radio. Then after six weeks, you got to pay another one fifty. But in six weeks, if your song buzzing that hard, you doing shows for 20, 30, 40, 50,000 or whatever the number was. Uh -huh. And he was able to make his money back through the shows, pay it again, shoot the video, and then the rest is history because they got motion. Right. <laughs> and they getting at it all over the country. And these some new little kids rapping. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know. yeah. So, okay. W when did the Atlanta rap persona, like, w like how long did you rock out with that for? Before you went to back this, to being JT the bigger figure? Actually, I never stopped. Oh, so you still use that other name, yeah, though? Yeah, that name, Fig Panamera. Oh, I, I got, I got contact. Yeah, I made movies with that. So I live on through all the movies I made. Fig Panamera. <laughs> You know, uh, doing movies down south, I became, I got a cult following, like Snow on the Bluff. Right. Okay, Snow on the Bluff one, somebody else made. But when I found this guy named Curtis Snow. And how did you find him? He lived down the street from me. I lived down the street from him. I'm in West Side. I live in the hood. Your life has way too many weird coincidences and all these interactions with all these people yes. who became legendary. It's yes. so fucking weird. Yes, bro. Listen. And throughout all these eras, like you're not supposed to meet Young Thug or Migos when you also were doing all this shit with Master P and all this back shit in back the, in the day. And now I got songs with them. We making videos. We doing movies. They like, because nobody never knew how old I was. They never asked. Right. But it wasn't how old I was. It was that I was willing to dribble the ball on the court. It ain't about what you did championships back. Get on the court right now and score. Right. So when I start making these projects with the right people at the right time, I became a face within the Atlanta movement. Mm. But when I make the movies, that's when I became a top figure because there was not that many movie makers mm. that consistently was putting them out. I put out so many movies in Atlanta that's featuring these guys that's mega stars that people thought Fig Panamera was from Atlanta. Right. But Fig Panamera is from Atlanta because that's where I created them through them streets of Atlanta. Okay. Okay, another person, too, that we got to throw in there within this same time period, when Kevin Gates got out of jail, we got the same lawyer. Do you know Kevin Gates signed with me first before really? he signed his first project when he got out of jail uh, with a song called Flashlight, I mean, uh, Satellites. Uh -huh. That's the song that got him up through there where Warner Brothers came and got song, him. Yeah. But um, as Fig Panamera, me and Kevin Gates did a whole project together. Uh -huh. It's on iTunes to this day. Before came or after you signed them? Nah, when I signed them, okay. it was distribution only. Then I paid them to do a project that we did together because I'm like, shit, people like this dude. It's a little different, but I'm going to try it. Man, he ended up blowing. I'm like, shit, boy, I got everything. See, I'm smart. I'm paying for shit that I'm going to own in the future. Wherever they go, cool. They don't got to bring me. I'm an investor. I'm investing in intellectual property. MP3s, WAV files, MOV files, MP4 files, photos, uh, Pro Tools. I'm investing in that because he who paid a bill control the skrill when it come back. He who paid a debt control the check when it come in. So by me buying the studio time, paying the producers, paying the artists, that's my shit, period. But, okay, I'm going to say something to you that people always say to me, which is like, like people always are like, how did you not sign like this artist who you met super early on or this artist or whatever? And it's like, they're right. 
that that would have been very beneficial to me financially and shit. It's just not really where my head is at. I'm not the type of person who wants to put a huge amount of effort into managing an artist or trying to make them pop or whatever, even if I think they're super talented. I just am kind of focused on this. Um, is there part of you that is like, fuck, I would be maybe up like an insane amount of money right now if I had just signed like a couple of those artists throughout those years. Signing an artist is like having a new baby. Yeah. If for you sure. sign an artist, and I don't care what deal it is, mm -hmm. whatever your responsibility is, it's going to come with paying for photo shoots, studio time, clothes, cash advancements, airplane tickets, promo packages, uh, artist development, A&Rs, interviews. So I don't want that responsibility of babysitting. So those things of me paying for project by project right. is a safer investment that I don't owe that you could say, oh, man, I signed to you and my career didn't go. I never want nobody to say I held them back. Yeah, because if an artist blows up, at some point they're going to hate you because they're going to feel like that you don't deserve your percent. That's why I say let me just do my deals based on what I own. And if they blow up, if they don't blow up, they're going to hate you because they're going to think you're the reason they you're didn't the blow reason up. You're the reason why. Yeah, <laughs> uh -uh, I don't want that responsibility. Yeah, definitely. But, okay, um, in terms of uh, Atlanta rap history – uh, okay, you you were around Young Thug and Lucci like real early on. I did Lucci first song that he got that ever came out is on me and Gucci Man album because Nut, R.I.P. Big Nut, right. me and Nut was friends. So Nut brought me Lucci to try to help get him going. So the first thing I ever did for Lucci because of Nut was put him on me and Gucci Man album. Wow. And by me doing that, that was just a kickoff. And, f and then I paid for the photo shoot. His very first video shoot that he ever done, I paid for that. I was the executive. But he wasn't my artist. I was just helping Nut to mm -hmm. just help raise his How'd profile. you know Nut? Because he lived down the street, too. Okay. <laughs> 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 Welcome to Atlanta, man. Phil Mo Atlanta. I, I bought me a neighborhood. Well, I didn't buy a neighborhood. I just bought like a quarter acre, uh, uh, 0.36 acres in a neighborhood called Dixie Hill right next to Bankhead, right. west side of Atlanta, zone one. When I bought that land, then I bought the house across the street. The buildings that's bandos right there, the apartments or the projects that was dilapidated and all messed up, I spray painted Phil Molana, signifying my hood, Phil Mo, I'm born and raised San Francisco. But I'm in Atlanta and I ain't going nowhere. This is my land, this is my house, and these projects right here, don't nobody want them. So I'm gonna shoot movies up in here, call it Phil Mo Atlanta. And that's how I planted myself into the trenches because I brought Young Thug and Migos and all these different rappers, you know, uh, to this neighborhood that's already a popular neighborhood. It's just that it's abandoned now and don't nobody want it. So the numbers of people back here is down. But by me coming here making these movies, it's like I turned it into my own Tyler Perry set. We got our own corner store. We got some bandos. We got some, some trap houses. We got a little studio right here. You know, we got all the elements of making movies because it looked like a damn movie back there. Mm. Yeah, it looks like it. So that, and me and Nut, when me and Nut start doing the movies, at one point, Young Thug was my bro. Nut, that's my bro. Right. Lucci, that's my bro. They all in the movies with me. Uh, R.I.P. Trouble, that's my bro. Like, <laughs> R.I.P. Trouble. The, 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 I was able to capture the Atlanta motion at that particular moment was a classic moment in time. The rich homie Quines, mm. you know, all of this. It wasn't no drama. It was all about money and competition of, of trying to get to the top. So the competition is, is always present. But the beef part, I can't say I was part of that. But Nut was my brother. Thug was my brother. But by me and Nut being so close, when Nut passed, then me and Thug relationship, it went to the left. Really? Because people like, oh, Fig love Nut. But 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 Thug live in zone three. Nut live in zone one. So this is who I'm around every day. But I was with Thug before Nut. Uh -huh. And then at a certain point, we all came together up under Birdman. 
Rich Gang. So not the one brung me to be part of the new motion with Rich Homie Quan and Doug, Birdman, you know, uh, Lifestyle, New Song, all that. They about to do a joint project. Nut brung me, and I was in charge of all the street promo for the Rich Gang. Mm. From here to Miami, to Texas, to, to Tennessee, that, that was me and my people. Cause I gathered, up, I did my deal with the homeless people in Atlanta. You were doing I, the like signs and the shit eight on the side of the road, and I print up a hundred of those, and it's five hundred homeless people that be in these little small areas. So I would spend my money with them, and they would help me pass out the flyers. So it made me look like I J T run the city or Fig Panamera. Uh. He running the city. Why? He running the street side of it because he do street promotion. Everybody else doing internet, YouTube, World Star. DJ, JT got a hundred some homeless people that love him because I don't throw money to strippers no more. I throw my money to the homeless people. <laughs> they will stand out there all day passing shit out and hold my signs at every exit, major exit throughout the city. And I ran that campaign for three years. That's how come Nut brought me to Birdman. When Birdman seen my campaign, he like, oh yeah, you got the job, homie. Right. And that's how I that's how I got in, inducted into the rich game motion and unfortunately within a few months it started being disputes happening um competition between Doug and and, and Rich Homie and Yeah what's your perspective on why they fell out <clears throat> Maybe we can get you to be more honest than they have been about it I think I think I just think it was just pure competition because Doug Rich Homie had a bigger buzz before Thug. Okay, let's just start with that first. True. Okay. But Thug motion started going up through the roof without Rich Homie, right? So when they recorded a few songs and Birdman was like, shit, we're going to do this lifestyle. So that kind of made them be together. So it was fine and dandy. But the streets was, oh, climb better. Thug better. Climb better. Thug better. Mm. So I don't think it was like, oh, we gonna kill each other, you know, because I don't know how none of that part played out. My part was music, you feel me? But to be honest, from my own perspective, everything happened just based upon competition, money and power, positioning. Mm. As far as why Nut was killed, I can't give you the answer. I, I don't know. But when I, when, when, certain groups of people started to celebrate celebrate then that's what the public could see like oh maybe they got something to do with it maybe they don't or they just happy that he out of here mm. uh rich homie Quan had to fall back at a certain point after that because now this shit is is gang orientated this ain't about just no rap shit this is gang orientated now because People was upset on different sides, you know, different stuff happening. Then, of course, Lucci, you know, and his team is having a feeling. Words being said, different stuff is happening. Me, I stayed out of it, but what I didn't stay out of, I kept repping for nut. So in all my movies, I always was repping for nut. You if know you, what I mean? Maybe you can answer this. Did nut date and or have sex with Fonnie Willis? <coughs> oh, shit. <laughs> 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 I don't want the DA mad at me. Hey, listen. I heard stuff. Right. I can't verify. Okay. <clears throat> I just heard through the streets. Um, but how you know you hear hella stuff. Right. I just can't say I'll be lying. It's like such a good story that it would have spread whether it was true or not. That's why I said I don't want her mad at me thinking, <laughs> oh, JT, you don't. Cause I live there, you I'm know. I'm out of her jurisdiction. If I know, I, now, I now, see you. you. You got the power to speak. <laughs> nah, but on a, on a serious note, man, I heard all the rappers knocking off the polices and DAs at the club. You know, you know, Atlanta is a place where the police kind of party with you, and really, the DA might, or I ain't gonna say her. Officials, right? They like to party at night too, though. Uh huh. They like guys. They like girls. They like to drink. They like to smoke. Even some officers, right? Because the nightlife there is so powerful and strong, that's like a normal thing that a, a, a city official will be at Magic City or at Blue Flame or something, mm -hmm. you know? Were you shocked when the footage of uh, Rich Homie Kwan snitching came out? You know what? 
I could never when I when I seen that, I couldn't see no video of him talking to the police. I just hear him talking, but I hear some officers, or I hear somebody that seemed like officers, or maybe it's an interview. I think he got tricked. I don't know. I, I because if you snitching, that means you know for sure what happened. Uh huh. Your assumption in being heartbroken. I heard a man talking that sounded heartbroken, and and going by what the streets is saying. But like him physically knowing, like, oh yeah, they did it for sure. I don't think nobody can really do that except in the trials when you go find out, like, yes, this happened, bam, bam, bam. Because in the rap game too, you could say Adam did it, or them no jumper motherfuckers did it. <laughs> but did Adam do it, or was it your man's over there? Right. Well, that's, what, that's why they got the Rico. Boy, okay. <laughs> nah, real shit. Did Adam do it, or did your man's over there do it? Because it's it's, it's still looking like no jumper. So. Yeah. Um, it's just one thing I always did. I never want to, by me, even though there is things I could say, but that going to be buried with my brother Nick. Mm. See, that that's how I got to be. I got to be like that. Why? I live in Atlanta, but they know Fig love Nut, though. So if there was a dispute, Fig love Nut. Well, what's up? Why you mad at Doug? I'm not mad at Doug. I just know the side he chose. So I'm like, shit, we got great whatever we did already. But as far as moving forward, I still got to talk to Nut Mama and his daddy and his brother and his baby mama and his son. And when I go see his son, I'm knowing I'm looking at a man or a young man that his daddy made sure I knew his family. Mm. One thing Nut, he like, bro, I'm taking you to my mama. Like, it's almost like he knew he was going to pass away. But he wanted me connected to his family, so I'm like, shit, I, I got, I stand with the family. But you feel like his family would look at you crazy if you were hanging out with the slimes? Oh, they'd definitely be looking at me like, what? Mm. Because I'm already chose in my movie, Dirt on My Boots. Man, I'm at nut graveside, tripping, mad. You know, I didn't say nothing, incriminate nobody or nothing, but I did it in the movie way. But that made them probably hate me too, though. Mm. Yeah, and I still live there, so it's like, shit. I know uh, be smooth in zone three. <laughs> Fee, you know, you didn't do nothing, but still. Right. If you love, you know, once your, once it, once it's known that you love somebody who gone, the ops or whenever, anybody who call themselves ops and all that, they want to take out the person who still love the person who gone. Mm. So they just inherit the hate. But, you know, I kept mine pretty smooth. You know, I keep, keep I stick to my business. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But this what I didn't, this one I, this is when, this one, I, I had a, 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 a attitude or a feeling about the When I got shot, he in the studio with some of my people. And the, the word come, come through the studio, they boy, that boy Fig just got hit. He like, they ain't killed that nigga yet. Really? When he said that, I'm like, oh. And you just heard about it from your I'm friends? in the hospital. My man's like, Fig, bro, I'm over here, man. And that nigga thug them over here like they celebrating, man. Talking about you should have been dead. I'm like, oh yeah, Damn. fuck them niggas, man. So that's how you found out that they think of you like that. That's how when when I when when I got that from a reliable source. That's when I'm like, oh, he's just mad because I love Nick. But nigga, you you got Birdman them. You got this and that. You balling now. You big time. Nigga, mm. You you out of here. Oh, so this is all the way back then. I'm saying 2017 when I got shot. Mm -hmm. Nick got killed in 2015. The beef, whatever them dudes had going on, they already had whatever they going on. I, I never had nothing to do with that. Right. So for him to celebrate, when I was somebody that, that I helped Doug get his mama a spot before the money with Birdman. See, I'm part of shit before the shit. So when these dudes act a certain way, I'm like, bro, come on, man. Uh -huh. Come on, come on, Jeffrey. Come on, bro. Like, you know, and I know he going through his situation right now and Lucci. Right. Whatever happened is God plan. I, I don't have no power or no say so because I gotta make sure I don't get killed. Right. Just the way this game go, as much as niggas rooting for all these people, boy, you better keep it on you. You got yours on you, boy. How you mo moving out here, boy? Like I stay in my zone. I stay in my motion. I don't I don't step outside to be tough. I'm not tough. But by me not giving up my money that day is because somebody that I helped before was trying to rob me. And that's why I got shot. Okay, Man, so where were you that day? I was in Four Season Projects, Thomasville. 
Okay. Zone three. I've been in there for four, five years. I've been feeding niggas and helping them get on that shit, bringing them to the studio. We making four, five movies in this same project. I didn't have way more money over there, but one day. You, I came you were on. just staying out there, like you just don't mind living in the projects? No, I wasn't living there. Oh, I'm saying I was I was working, networking. Okay. And I worked in every hood in Atlanta. Okay. So by me helping to feed these dudes, somebody from there though caught the shot on me, like, man, we gotta rob this nigga today. Right. Fuck all that movie shit and helping nigga. That's robbing. But my people in Atlanta say feed. They kill their own friends over there. So for you to get killed, there's no. There's, but did, were you wearing jewelry or did you have anything nope. worth taking? Nope. I had money in my pocket that they just assumed. But by me not giving up that money, I took Draco bullets. Because imagine I'm in the project. I'm already surrounded by 15 people. But everybody there, they just watching. Only two or three is trying to press me for the money. So they got their camera phones out. Do you know none of that footage never made it really? to the internet? Because, big, you should have just gave it up. But I just... Men in the streets, it's not that you tough. It's just some days we all know we could be robbed, right? But if you telling yourself, like, I'm not getting robbed today, though, bro. Not by no niggas I know. Now, if these some new niggas with these guns on me, I would have gave it up. But since I know these niggas, like, hold on, nigga. Right. And they asked me for the money for 10 minutes straight before the first bullet start flying. So Most he just walks up to you and points a Draco at you? And nah, just we inside the projects. You know, I came over there to drop some food off. I came to drop some food off for the hood because it was somebody's birthday. One of the kids or something, and my man was like, Fig, they got something in the hood today. So when I come, we pass the food out. They all watching me. They got the guns and shit out there. They're not saying nothing. I'm with the mamas. I'm with their kids. They kids hugging me, different shit. But when I walk around the corner to go to the car, that's when one of their big homies was like, hey, boy, go rob that nigga. So when they came to rob me, these the same dudes I didn't had in the studio. This is like a level of griminess that's hard to this comprehend. The level of griminess. That's a fucking wild Boy, story. Listen, and you know, shit, it, it just I I didn't feel like getting robbed, and I'm like I'm not getting robbed today. I just had my baby yesterday. And, and how well came, how well did you know these these dudes? Are I've been with them for four five years. What the fuck? That's how I go though. Just like the people that kill Young Dolph. Right. They got, man, listen, the people they say allegedly kill Young Dog, right? They got some pictures where they all together. Mm. Then I seen some pictures of Nipsey Hussle with the dude that killed Tim. I'm like, hold yeah. on. Then they showed me some pictures of Mo3 with some people posing. I say, the back door is what was the attempt because it's easy to rob somebody who already think you cool with them. It's easy to rob somebody who coming to visit you, and you don't know today they're gonna rob you or kill you. Right. It's a back. It's called back dough. The more of a betrayal it is, the easier to pull off it is. The more why? What that man? Because uh, they're uh, opening themselves up to the, uh, you more and more. Man, what that man Caesar? When they said, "Hey, let's kill Caesar." Mm. This is coming from his crew though. Caesar, the dude Caesar from back at the, the, the Romans or whatever that shit was. Right, yeah, Where yeah, Caesar yeah. was from? Was it Rome? Is that Rome, Caesar? Man, listen. Somebody said, we need to kill him. And then they said, yeah, but if you kill him, you and your family finna go down. But if we kill him, who they gonna blame it on? So they agreed that we going to kill him. So I guess whenever Caesar came back out of his room or whatever for some meeting and all them people start stabbing him, the main person, he didn't say nobody's name while he's getting stabbed, but one person. And he said, Brutus, my brother, not you. Mm. Brutus was his right-hand man, and Brutus agreed to uh, 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 and give it to him too. So he mo hurt. He ain't hurt by everybody stabbing him. Okay, damn, this is okay, they got me. But damn, Brute is not you. That's the famous line that I got from the, the betrayal of Caesar, how they how they began to, you know, knock that, that kingdom down or that 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 empire. It's the people that you trust. Betrayal can't happen for somebody that you already watching for. Betrayal come from your right hand man, your foe, the person you dealing with. Anybody within your circle that's, that you give access to you, your address, your location, your motion, your movement, where your baby mama live, where your studio at, all of these different things, the more people that have that on you, 
the more doorways and back doors that you might have to start closing by eliminating going around these people or inviting them or going around them because something telling you this is a back door. Why? Because I trust bro. And was this a Curtis Snow situation? No, Curtis Snow had nothing to do with this. He wasn't involved? No, nah, no, nah, hell okay. no. Nah. I mean, I think he did some interviews where he tried to act like he was part of it, but okay. Nah. And most times when people shoot you with a Draco, they finish you off. So God stepped in as I took them first one here and two right here and Look at this, 7.62. That's not the one that... When this you the get, one that's going by my face. Okay, but the ones... The, the, the had, body. Man, you got, you these, got hit twice in the stomach? Man, listen, let these people see this shit, man. Jesus Christ, that Passion. is wild. Now, this is real shit. I, I'm, you're looking at a ghost. <laughs> I'm really a ghost. The man stood over me. It, went, it is crazy went, you're still alive. Listen, he went, boom. He sat me down. I went, ah. Oh. Then he went, boom, boom. That bitch hit my leg twice, pop, pop. And then the last one... It missed my face, but it skint my arm. I said, oh, God bless me. This is my favorite one. It ain't this big one on my body. It's this one when it went by my face. And did you take off running? Or I you... couldn't run. Right. He took off running and forgot to get the money, so this was an angry shooter. What fuck it, fuck? I'm just shooting you because you didn't listen. You didn't listen. We trying to rob you, man. Listen, you got three Dracos right here and 15 guys. Y'all could have jumped me and stripped me naked and took everything. That would have been worse than getting shot. But instead, I took the bullets and everybody ran and left me there. Then the nigga came back and said, Fee, we called 911, bro. Ambulance was there in about eight, nine minutes. As soon as the first thing when the police come, they taking me out the car. And I got to get this footage, too. I got to subpoena my, the camera footage of me when they was doing this, right? Guess what the police keep saying? You looking at my wounds and my guts hanging out my body. Have you ever seen intestines hanging out your body? Man, listen, Drake I've never went, seen a scar went straight like that. through, went through my body. He say, man, who shot you, man? Uh, we got to get justice for your family, man. Come on, we'll, who shot you? Give us a name. I say, a white man shot me with orange hair and he had a suit on. <laughs> <laughs> the police say, man, get this ass asshole up out of here, right? Because he wanted me to tell, guess where the shooter was at? He was standing right there in the crowd. He left and changed his clothes and came back. I could have easily pointed him out. Guess what I did? My One of my favorite Tupac pictures, when he going in the ambulance like this. You have so a picture I, like that? Nah, I need the footage. <laughs> the police told me that's enough. Listen, I know I don't know if I'm going to die or not. All I want them niggas to say, bitch ass nigga, I didn't get my money up, nigga. It don't, I wasn't tough. It's just that that day, I didn't feel like getting robbed. I'm like, I ain't getting robbed today. But you didn't even think about snitching? I couldn't snitch. In that moment? I couldn't. You know why? That's why I want that footage. I blamed it on Donald Trump because I'm taking it to the grave with me. Wow. Hell yeah, I'm taking mine to the grave. They respect that too. Wow. Nigga, you change your clothes. All I have to do is point you out right there. But I'm like, nope. I just had to hit him with these. That's why I want that camera footage. That's going to be awesome. They're going to say, that boy Fig is a nut. Holy then I get shit. to the hospital. They doing an emergency surgery on me. I see the doctors got their iPhones. I asked the nurse, give me my phone. They got me pumped up with uh, Novocaine and uh, uh, what that other shit called? Uh, morphine. The morphine, the Novocaine, and Dilaudid. Dilaudid, the most powerful pain medicine on the planet, more than fentanyl, anything else. It's called Dilaudid. Man, they hit me with that Dilaudid, and then they got this footage where they got their hands in my guts trying to sew up the internal bleeding, and I'm filming it for my movie. It's in my movie. <laughs> they say you the illest, bro. I was like, shit, what nobody going to believe. If I didn't die, That's what amazing. was going through your head is nobody's going to believe this. Nobody going to believe, nigga. I'm still alive. Nigga, let me get this footage. <gasps> Holy Straight shit. Straight up, bro. Nah, like, I don't know. It's just something as a filmmaker. Once I took my filmmaking serious, it's like these are moments that's vulnerable, but if I still got to film it because mm. it's going to be powerful later. If I don't die, nigga, I'm going to be able to use this, you know, uh, to, to put the message out to all the other people. Boy, you better calm down. How long were you in the hospital? 45 days. Jesus. I couldn't eat no food. All my food was through. Through a tube? Hell yeah. Damn. Through a, yeah, I'm like, man, I can't wait to taste some chicken or something. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, your, your intestines, we had to tie you on. You know, your intestines, you got 75 feet. You can lose up to half of that, and you can still be all right. So they cut off out of 75 feet, probably 30 feet. So you're like, you lucky. 
Dijo, uh, what is it? The small intestine and the big, no, the big intestine is short. Okay, small intestine is the one with 75 feet. Uh -huh. So that's what your food traveled through. So 30 feet is gone. But it's like, shit, I can't tell. I got a metal rod in my leg right now. Really? When I go through the airport. It goes off? Beep. <laughs> step over here. <laughs> I'm like, nah, man, ain't no gun, nothing. That's a You feel all right now? Nah, I'm good. Really? Man, I done had new babies and everything. Everything works. Oh, everything works. Everything works, man. Wow. Listen, it's a blessing. That's why I wanted to show that. I'm like, listen, man, you're looking at a ghost. How many kids you got? Seven. Seven. How many moms? Three. Two okay. baby mamas, one wife. And then five by one woman and one by one each by the others. Right. Yup. And I going? take care of all of them. No, I love it. Hell yeah, I'm, I'm a super dad. Hell yeah. I'm a super dad. Fuck that. I'm going for broke, and I try to change my ways up. You know what I mean? You think you're going to be making babies till the day you die? Nah, I think that's <laughs> it. Yeah, I'm, I want you, grandkids. You're done. I'm, I'm, pushing, I'm pushing my kids. Man, y'all need to have some babies, man. How old is the oldest one? 28. 28? She didn't have a baby yet? No, nah, it's a boy. Now, oh. he, he said he don't even want no kids ever. He like, man, I don't want no baby mamas because I see how everybody What's he into? Fuck. He into the to the other life. Oh, yeah. okay. But I'm trying to get them on this side. Now, I got the one that's 21. He at the hotel. I got one that's three. Them two, they at my hotel right now. I, we just drove out here from Atlanta oh, yeah. for two days. Yeah, so, so <laughs> how, how do you get back to normal life after that? <laughs> All right. Um, I must say that in the midst of me getting shot, I was... I was actually living it, cause it was it was it was a lot of gunplay. A lot of gunplay was going on in Atlanta because, and I'm not, not in no way am I a gangster. I'm not a gangster at all. Uh -huh. I've never been a gangster, right? I always had respect for life. I always thought like killing should be the last option, you know, uh, to solve my problem. Cause I got so many friends in jail for murder, from their emotions that I learned like. You still got to be responsible even if you do got murder on your mind because your emotion will make you do it and then you did it in your own car and you had your phone on you. You didn't have your mask on. Right. You didn't have no gloves on. You touched the bullets that came out. You left prints. You left DNA, your fingerprints in the car. All of these elements of how somebody end up in prison for doing something that maybe they did have to do revenge, retaliation, but they didn't do it clean. Mm. So I just thought that I gotta be responsible with murder and that's not that's not my first choice because the guy that shot me, I actually went back to the projects, right? And was just doing homework, right? Because homework, just homework, hanging like out, to studying, see, see what car, see what you know, see what I could see, you know, to see how I could catch this dude, right? So one day I go over there, but I'm in my car and I got somebody else driving, and we see this dude walk out the gate with his head down. He on his phone walking to the store that's across the street, but in that split moment with this Draco sitting on my lap. I say, I'm in my car. As much as I wanted to get this done, God gave it to me. There you go. Ain't nobody outside except these cameras right here that I just drove through. I'm in my car. I got a new dude driving my car. So I say, pull around the corner. I had a drone on me. I put the drone in the air and went over and flew it over the store. What the fuck? And watched him walk out and just recorded him to show him you was dead, boy. <laughs> you busted a drone out? I pulled the drone out. <sighs> then look, then I put the drone over the projects when he walked back with everybody else and I brought bring the drone down low enough so they could see that the, it's a drone on them, right? Then I turn my live on and show my iPad that I'm watching these niggas with the drone, with the Draco sitting on my lap. Like This was my way of getting showing them like, boy, but two weeks after this, I'm on my way to Africa where I'm about to move over there for some time. And I just thought in my mind, what if I kill this nigga and then just move to Africa? But when I see the scenario of how I caught him, it's like, I'm gonna throw my life away. So right. instead of throwing my life away, let me just show him that I could have killed him. And then I put it on my live. 
them niggas start shooting at the drone. <laughs> but nobody <laughs> hit the drone. It's got to be hard. But that it's was tiny. just my way of just showing them, like, some people going to do beef different. And you got out of there clean? I got out of there clean. What and I made it fuck? to Africa two weeks later. But I was able to film the my person that got me, that shot me. <laughs> Boy, you see how I just had you? I had you, and I had your niggas too. Because y'all that needs to be. Well, did you make a movie with that scene? I got the footage, and one day I'm gonna put it out. You gotta like do something in a movie to like just recreate that dynamic. Yes, That's because insane. that that because the drones. I'm into that from being a filmmaker. So I always remember I could fly this drone a, a mile this way. Uh huh. As long as I'm you know moving it right, I could. Oh, so you were pretty far away with? The- I was just. Uh, right across the street in a different parking lot. So while they looking for me, they don't know which what area I'm in, but they know this drone right here, but the drone got capability to go a mile. So, so so you didn't do it, you didn't kill him because you were in your own car? What if you were- I didn't kill him. What if you happened to be in a, a different car? Well, put it like this. When somebody shoots you, you got the right to shoot their ass back, right? right. But if I'm gonna throw my life away, your life ain't worth my life. Mm. Because even if you did and I'm in prison, then that's a bad situation. So let me just show you that I could have just killed you, though. Right. That was my way. And a big load of revenge came off my shoulders because as a man, you want to get the person back who done something to you. But as a result of me knowing all of the guys who got revenge and they dealing with the circumstances of prison life, I'm like, shit, nah, it ain't worth it like that. Not right now, it ain't. Mm. And I'm not on this. I'm not on this podcast to say like I'm some tough nigga or not. nah. This was my way of getting revenge to show him that I could have just killed you, boy. Right. You feel me? So my vision is bigger than turf life. My image in Atlanta, because for my image that would have been great. Oh, that boy out of here. But also, I could be paying for it right now. Mm. Ain't no secrets on the murder shit. That license plate gonna come back to the investigator somehow, some way. Right. Was your phone in the area? Your phone was pinging off this tower. I didn't seen enough first 48 to know. <laughs> Boy, listen, if you in your own car, you stupid. And if you got your phone on, you stupid. Yeah. And if you ain't got no gloves on, you stupid. If you ain't got no mask on, you stupid. Because one of them gas station stops along the way from wherever you was at coming, they gonna pull up the footage of everywhere this car been at in the last 24 hours or whatever. Right. And they gonna check your phone if you come back as a suspect to see where was your phone pinging at. So yeah, it wasn't a clean getaway. Right. But for my heart and my chest, yeah. I respect I, it. Yeah, nah, because I had enough shooting situations in Atlanta where I survived. And I had close range shootings where I survived and didn't never get hit, but I'm like, how many more shootouts can you have? That was luck. Boy, that boy missed you like that. You right. know what I mean? Somebody got an AK bussing. I shoot through my windshield with my gun, and it's a rusty uh, Colt 45 Colt. It's a nine Colt. It's something I shouldn't have had. Uh-huh. I should have had the Glock thing. I would have probably been feeling better. Nope. You got a 12-shot. <laughs> <laughs> you got the 12-shot silver, rusty, you know what I mean, two. Right. And this dude got the K. But when he busting it, you know, the K got the kick. So it's actually missing the car, even though he close. Pow! That motherfucker going up. So I just shoot through the windshield and get up out of there. By me shooting through the windshield, it was shock value to him. Like, damn, he's shooting through the windshield. Uh-huh. Then I shoot through the side window when he run to the side. But when it's broad daylight, I pull up out of there. He, they didn't get hit. I didn't get hit. But... This was a situation I just had to come pull up over here. But I didn't know this nigga was going to run out the house. Busting, though. I'm I'm talking to this dude, but he's like, he's telling his partner to come out. His partner to come out, though, and did what he supposed to did. But that's one shootout situation where I know if he had a little bit more heart and just got ducked down a little more and just start tagging the car through the door and the window to make sure he panicked that bullets was coming back to him so, so close because we was this... Literally, with that camera, and I'm in this car, and he run downstairs. So the distance of seeing, you know, and hearing that thing busting again, <laughs> I'm like, I might not get lucky in some of these other situations. Yeah, Jesus. Um, wow. Okay. So, has your life been like fully focused on filmmaking since then? Software. Software as well. Software over these last six months, 
I have recorded some more films to put on my uh, platform. It's called Trap Flicks. And uh, I got an app. It's a free app on all platforms, uh, Android, iOS. And all my independent hood movies is on my app. Uh-huh. But software, I'm realizing platforms is important right now. So um, I moved to Africa in 2019. And I moved back January 2023. So I did like approximately three years over there. Okay. And over there, I built water wells. I bought land. I fed the people. I did music. I learned the culture. I lived in Burkina Faso, West Africa, 15 months. I did two years uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. That's East Africa. They speak English. I was able to realize that software makers is all around here. And it might be a guy that might don't have that much money or it might even look poor, but he know how to do code. So I went through a bunch of money testing different people while, you know, running into some brick walls. Then I got blessed to meet the right guys who had a team and they was able to put me another app together, uh, the Traplix app. So now I'm trying to expand by having software developers I can not only do this app, but I can really make any kind of app because code writers can make you what you order. Whatever you order, I want an app that does this. Then they write the code specifically for that. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to like, as they told me, I want a, uh, I want an R&B beat with the trap drums. It's like I'm telling him that, so he write the drums for this, he write the, the organs or the, the, the bass sounds. When you're doing code, it's numbers and letters and dots and, you know, punctuation points and parentheses and dollar signs and all of these different things is what make Instagram and make uh, Facebook or Netflix is code writing. So that is the new next phase of me as I get older and as I look at what what's going to give me some power. The filmmaking is I'm, I'm more interested in than signing artists or doing musical projects. Um, because one movie on Tubi right now, for instance, shot on the iPhone can make somebody $150,000 in three months if your movie is pretty good. Mm. And it doesn't have to be the best, biggest quality or the biggest camera. It's the concept of your movie. For instance, they say Glorilla, the female, right? Glorilla had a particular buzz. She hood, but she got the hair... You know, she she got the makeup, you know, different things. Then this new girl come out of nowhere named Sexy Red. I seen this comparison mm -hmm. yesterday, and I was, they're like, how did Sexy Red pass up? You know, and I'm just watching. But she coming with the the wretchedness and the hoodness of, from the female side, showing the wretchedness of it and not more or less like the popularization of the $2,000 hair with the, you know, $300 eyelashes and all <laughs> right. this stuff. She coming with the straight. A little more raw. So I look at, I look at, at making movies, some similar, and looking at the software, how to, how to merge building the platform and then creating the specific content as opposed to me just looking for everybody else's film, but to create this product on a platform that I own, then open the door for others because I'm a filmmaker. So if nothing else, by me owning the software and the content, I don't have a middleman. Right. So all it is is every time I get a new download, that's adding to my value because even at just 100,000. Yeah, so explain this. This right here is my first electronic product because I wanted to be like Steve Jobs. Uh -huh. Steve Jobs made his own phones. I mean, made his own computers by having the code, first of all, the iOS, when they first did it. Steve Wozniak was the person who wrote it. Steve Jobs had the idea and knew the software person. So that's like me saying, well, I have the mouthpiece like Steve Jobs, and I have the idea, but I don't write code. So now I got code writers. Well, I went to China to say, I need to put, I need to make my own device. I need to have me a phone and a tablet. And of course they bundled me up like a, you know, a tin pop. <laughs> so this is my device right here. It's an Android. I did this in 2016. This right here has the capability of 
putting two chips. So you could take your chip out your phone, put it in here, and then make the calls because it's an unlocked Android device. Uh-huh. The iPhone, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't put your stuff on there because they want exclusivity of what goes on there. But Android say you can goddamn do what you want. You just paying us for the device. Right. You put whatever you want on there. So I put my movies preloaded onto this phone in 2016, and I made 3,000 of them, right? And I'm like, I'm going to test it out because I, I want to make a TV. Because in China, you can get a TV made for $34 each TV if you buy, you know, at least 1,000 of them. 34,000, you got your own TV with your name on it. It's an Android device, an Android operating system is an operating system that allow any developer to do whatever you could create and put it on their products. So that's where I got the idea to go to China to make me some phones. So now my next phone, it will be smaller, uh-huh. my next tablet. But Traplix, you could download this app right now. And I'm proud of this right here because I went to China to do this. <laughs> Yeah, I went over there and didn't know nobody. I risked my life going in them China alleyways because I could have never came back. Right. <laughs> Not for real. <laughs> Bro, listen, that's so hood over there. What? Yeah. But that's where they got devices at for cheap. Right. It's a place called Shenzhen. Shenzhen is the hood where anything electric you could think of, a camera, a TV, they making it. And some of the spots they making it is in trap houses like a dope dealer or something. Really? And everybody, they, everybody was nice to you, though? No, nah, it was nice. Yeah, yeah. It was nice. But as dangerous as it was, though, I was like, but I'm like, if I get back to America with my own phone, maybe I don't get the credit right now, and this doesn't mean nothing to too many people. But when my story is being told, like, as of right now, you're the first person showing this. Uh-huh. When people catch on to what I've done, this is a blueprint for independency on so many levels where I started out as just a guy wanting to be a rapper to where I'm producing beats, I'm making films, I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm making my own magazines, I'm doing the software, I'm doing clothing manufacturing, like every element, I'm filming whole movies on an iPhone. This phone right here shoot a whole movie, mm-hmm. a one hour movie I could shoot on here. This one terabyte of data storage. So a lot of people is doing that. You can film on your phone and edit and then bounce it down oh, yeah. and turn it into one of your distributors or a company who want to put your movie out. It's 4K. Mm-hmm. No, it's crazy. What a world we live in. All right, so what are we missing here? What what crazy-ass stories that you've got under your, under your belt am I missing? There's got to be some other stuff here that we just somehow haven't haven't hit. I know, I'm trying to think of what, because there's so many different things that have happened. Because it is mind-blowing how many different lives you've led. Let me share this life. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me share this other life. Filmo Africa. Okay. Filmo Africa, 2017, I get invited, and this a month before I get shot. People calling me from Africa watching my movies my hood movies and my motion in Atlanta, Right. they call me and invite me to a country called Burkina Faso, West Africa, uh, above Ghana, um, n- not far from Nigeria. Um, it's in the news now for coops and all of that. But they invited me to come to Africa to help teach their the young population because out of 19 or 20 million people there, 60 to 65 percent of the people who live in Burkina Faso is 28 and under. Wow. They got millions of youth that terrorism, they would adopt terrorism because there's so much unemployment mm. that terrorism is an option where they be joined ISIS or Al Qaeda or some, and now they're working for that operation to. So they got brotherhood, and they got access to money, or they got access to eat. They got access to camaraderie. So the the people who invited me was like, we want to get the African young population into music making, film, filmmaking, software, uh, clothing, the spirit of do for self independent, and you got it. So I go there, and on my trip, I end up building a water well because I realized I thought I was coming to Africa to get some money from these people. 
I get there, there's no money like that. Mm -hmm. The people who pay for my first class round trip tickets, hotel and food and stuff, they made an investment to get me to come. But when I got there, I thought it was going to be big companies ready to throw dollars at me because I'm bringing some. No, JT. So I end up doing what they asked me to do on that trip. I was there maybe two weeks. I left them with a free water well. I come home, I get shot. When I was leaving, they're like, why are you leaving? It was so crazy that I came home, and it's like the next Frontier JT not going to just be running around hoods in America. You need to come to Africa and try that. If you do that, you're going to have Indiana Jones-type stripes now. You did all this. Go to Africa. That's the wildest thing out of whatever we talking about of me trying something new, and I'm going by myself. And I'm finna go in all these hoods over here by myself, of course, getting introduced by whoever introducing me. And I'm finna really try it. So I stay in America. I'm still having my little issues, you know, street issues. So I'm just, and after that shootout I had where I could have almost got knocked off, I'm like, man, I can't just get killed out here trying to prove I'm tough or prove that nigga I can get down with y'all. Take this take this opportunity, man. Go to Africa. So 2019, two years later, I get over there. I end up bringing my wife and kids over there. And three months later, they close the borders and say it's a new thing in the world called coronavirus <laughs> and nobody can leave anyway. So you got stuck there. No, I had moved there anyway. I oh. sold the house, the cars, everything. I'm like, I'm finna take a chance because people tell you, they love rap music in Africa. We, I didn't know nothing about that. I feel now, like you would the, do very well there. Man, I, I did. feel like they would like that energy. I did. That's the part I'm seeing. Like, yeah. for three years, that's what I've been doing. Sick. And I moved from country to country. Uganda, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Burkina Faso, Nairobi, Kenya. Like, these people know me now by doing music with their artists and filming and paying for water wells and stuff. So... The craziest thing, I think, is that me really trying to go to another country and think, I, you know, and use my JT, the bigger figure skills, to kick something off. Because over there, I'm JT. They didn't know Fig. Right. They well, knew JT. What, <laughs> was part figure. of why you moved out there because you wanted to, like, become more connected to your uh, your heritage? And do you feel like you've had that experience? I think I, I, think I was going to get that anyway, but I was more interested in becoming... Or if I create, if I make a success in another country, then I'm gonna have some more stripes on, up under my belt, and I got humanitarian stripes for my water wells because the water wells I I dropped off, I built three water wells in Africa. Over thirty five thousand people is using that water right now to this day wow. because I went down three thousand feet and this whole lakes under the earth, mm. and in Africa especially, if you drill deep enough. You got free water, but the person that live on the land can't afford no drilling to go down no thousand feet. Right. You got to have real money over there because that type of money. Now, I only spent $7,500 on the first one, $15,000 on the second one, $30,000 on the third one. The reason why the price went up, I moved to a different country where water costs more money. So if you want to get this water, because they know once they drill it, you can sell water now and be having money going on into the future. Mm -hmm. But I said, I, I didn't come to Africa to make money off y'all like that. Y'all could have it for free. So the villagers, they got to giving me names and, you know, putting these things on my head and these special coats and <laughs> these little cloaks and shit like, man, you are a brother. But the experience now... Did you know when I came back and I heard all these African artists on our radio station playing more than some of the rap music is that an African artist is on the radio? I was like, this shit happening. That shit finna jump over here and we loving what they had. Right. Even just today, uh, Ebro had a tweet where he said that all the labels- are, I reposted that. They're not focused on street Gangsta rap. rap no. They're trying to sign African artists and, and Latin, Latin artists. artists. Yeah. Because- it's 1.4 billion people over there. If you get one song to even do good in just a few other countries, your ass gonna have billions of streams. Yeah, that's what wild. I'm. That's what I was aiming for too. But I did do some artist work where I'm performing with the artist. But I said, shit, now 
I could just call and say, man, I'm trying to, let me, let me get, I am on 10 artists from over there. And I don't even got to be there now to do it because I know all the DJs, I know all the important people. So from my phone, I can make something shake. But when he posted that, I knew. I say, see, they was laughing at me going to Africa at first. They laugh. A lot of industry people are like, man, what the hell are you doing over there? Man, it look dusty. It look this. I say, bro, when they party, they got a stadium. Mm. When they do the club, it's 5,000 people and nobody got shot. Mm. Bro. They got clubs out here, bro, just like Atlanta, that doing that's doing numbers and they playing songs. So I need to see who's available, who not signed, and I start handpicking the, the guys like I did in Atlanta. I did that in Africa. So it's just the the hoods that I was in over there, the desperation in the hood is worse than where I got shot at. I just knew if I don't say a prayer, no matter if I'm going to help and feed or whatever. If I don't pray, these slums, I can die. I can die over here. And mm -hmm. you by yourself? So all that footage, I took it off YouTube, and now I'm finna bring that shit back. But do you have any sketchy situations out there, or was it pretty cool? Nope. Um, I, the, the most sketchy situation I had that dealt with violence is when I went on an Army base on accident filming and I wasn't supposed to, and they was talking to me in another language. So when he was like, da, 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 I'm like, man, all right, I'm gone, man. You know, but I'm on the army base. No, you just can't leave. What <laughs> the fuck you doing over here? I'm over here filming. Yeah, man, I'm over here. Man, they got to coming out of nowhere trying to get me on the ground. I stood my ground, but I definitely could have died because the officer said, bro, you know, we could have shot you. This is an army base. What the fuck? So that was my, that was my sketchiest <laughs> violence situation. But after that, Shit, I didn't do no more filming on the army base. I just right. stayed in the projects. I stayed in the hood. So you now now what is your your plan for your life? You've lived so many lives. You got so many different options. I know, huh? But like, what, what do you? I'm where do back you... now. Um, uh, of course, my family life important. So I say, you got to fall back from from some of this hood life. Like mm -hmm. this hood life, you already lived it. Or was Africa like a reset for you? Africa was a reset. Them three years I was over there, do you know I never carried a gun or a knife? Mm. But as soon as I get off the airport over here, when I get to Atlanta, I got to put that thing on me, and I got to be watching cars again and checking the situation and making sure the parking lot. You know, survival things of a black man that, that live in turf politics, situ like turf geopolitical with crime and violence and beef and maybe an op or two or somebody who want to rob you or you like you gotta put you gotta you gotta carry yourself a certain way. Right. You can't assume. Oh man, I don't got no beef with nobody. Nah, actually, I might not. But the person that wants your shit. When I got shot on two different occasions in Atlanta, it was attempted robberies in both times. I just I just wasn't going. But I called bullets for it. But because I made my mind up. You can't be out here screaming, California, West Coast, feel more this, feel more Atlanta, none of that, and you gonna just be letting niggas rob you. Cause once your name go across no jumper, as oh yeah, they hit Fig over there, they caught him, you know, nah. Because really? I already had pain in my face as that I'm standing on business. So mm. in them situations, without God help though, so thank you Lord, um, I'm still here, but you got to make your mind up. Are you agreeing? Are you predetermining that you're going to give your shit up when a gun get put in your face? Then you shouldn't even come out today. Now, be smart and think. Because if it's a situation where you got to give it up, then you got to give it up. But in these situations, I just felt I can, I can maneuver in this right here. Or I'm going to find out. But I can't. I can't. This ain't the go out moment right here. Right. You know what I mean? I got caught slipping out there one time. I'm like, damn it, man. In Africa? Nah, in Atlanta. Oh, okay. But after that, I'm like, oh, hell no, nah, man. I ain't going out. Because that's the thing about out there and everywhere. The element of the surprise. Mm. You right here not paying attention. These dudes plotting right now, you not paying attention. Or this brown car hit the block twice. And now they backing up right here. <laughs> Is that a sign to you? If a man is wide awake, that car... Then hit twice around here, so maybe I need to reposition myself, or let me make sure that I could see, so that if something happened, I could I could respond properly. But the main goal ain't to have to shoot nobody; is to avoid even having to deal with it. Right. Yep. So, but my life now though is definitely more um, appreciative of my OG status, of my of my of my transitions of 
you know, uh, things that I had to do to paint my face. Because if you're going to be in the jungle, you better be able to act like an animal too. Don't go in that jungle and you coming in here on some soft shit. Like going to Atlanta, when I seen how they was acting out there, I'm like, shit, it's like California, except I'm not part of nobody politics, so I can move freely. So the most thing I'm going to have to worry about is somebody attempted robbery. Mm -hmm. That is the element of Atlanta for an out-of-town nigga that's getting money. I'm in Corvettes, I-8s, I'm buying Sprinters. But I didn't do none of that balling type shit to actor. My first big money, I'm paying to the rappers. I'm buying beats. I'm paying for equipment. I'm doing, I'm paying for promo. I didn't want Atlanta to look at me like I'm somebody flossing. I didn't start doing that till about, yeah, till about 2015. I mean, I bought a couple foreigns, but that wasn't it. But when they start seeing I got 100 people working for me and the trap flicks everywhere and you know, I'm paying for the radio. I got albums with Gucci. I'm paying all the rappers off. So my name definitely has, oh, that nigga got some money. But since I don't sell weed, I think I would have got killed, robbed, or set up some kind of way if I was a weed dealer in Atlanta. Mm. Because you could be jealous of the rap shit, but if I'm selling weed, then you know y'all got access to me through me selling the weed. So yeah. one of the guys I'm selling to is talking with somebody who plotting and that's where the back dough come. That's one of the most common ways to get set up. Man, yeah. they buy a pound from you. It's good. They buy two more. They buy five. Y'all at Magic City. Maybe y'all had some drinks. Maybe he helped you with a gun or a broad or some type of other thing that's, that you say, man, these some cool dudes. Man, they buy my <laughs> weed. They helping me out. And then when it's time to sell the 10 pounds, that's where you get found stanking in the back of the park, the, mm. the bando. And they're going to kill you? They're not just going to take it? Man, listen, it. many men from California came to Atlanta just to sell their weed. They was good guys, but they didn't pay. They didn't understand that some markets, and I think the Bay like that too, maybe, you know, L.A., where we invite you in with a smile. Right. But you don't know that the whole play of making you smile is that when the first opportunity of this back door to run through, we gonna do it. Mm. But we ain't doing it for no four pounds. And you talking this other shit, you know, you got the 10 or the seven or the, the 20. Yeah, man, I'm finna bring a 20 pack out there. Oh, that's that's beautiful news to somebody that that do the back doors. And if they've been part of helping you move any of your packs now, the bigger order is where the murder gonna happen. Damn. Yeah, you a dinner plate. Oof. Now nah, it's a cold game. That's why I said game. I didn't sell. I didn't want to be known as a dope dealer. I don't want to sell no weed. I don't want to sell nothing illegal. You're making me thankful. I never got too deep in it. Because I never was successful anyway. I will be in the way. I can remember at one point when my mind did drift, when they made weed legal in the Bay, mm -hmm. and Burner came out with that shit called Cookies. Right. And them people in Atlanta wanted to pay five thousand and four thousand dollars for a pound, and my man, my man's and my people like, boy, you know, burner, I can get them for for fifteen or for two or you know, damn near high price type shit, right? I was like, man, and then my man's was like, boy, I could get a hundred of them down there, fig. What you want to do? I'm like a hundred of them, shit, I have four hundred thousand. You know, I'm thinking in my mind how easy. Or I'm thinking how I, I'm finna be able to possibly, maybe I could just do this and just help move this honey one time and then I'm out. Uh -huh. And then I, I see they caught Rallo on mm -hmm. an airplane, I think with like 400 pounds or whatever it was, right? And in my mind, I'm like, I ain't know that Rallo playing like that on private jets with 400. <laughs> this little 100 pound shit. I'm talking about taking over West Side Atlanta where it ain't about nothing. <laughs> they bringing in 500 in the top. Fee, you need to stay out this game. This is not for you. Yeah. Especially when I seen how Rallo got caught on a private jet. I'm like, how you got caught on a private jet? Well, maybe somebody told or whatever. But to me, I said, I don't want that for me right now that I'm finna try to bust me a move with these 100 pounds because in my mind, 100 pounds is a lot. Right. In my little area where I'm at in the West Side, I could be the man with a hundred pounds, right? And here goes somebody bringing a thousand fig. You not the man, and, you're not, <laughs> <laughs> and he ain't. It's somebody else that's probably doing two thousand or five thousand, right? But the moral of the story, I want to stay in my lane. I just completed thirty-one years in the rap game. Shout out to E Forty Too Short, 
you know, shout out to Mac Dre, Spice One, Huey MC, Rapper Forte, uh, Cool Nut, Black C, RBL Posse, like, you know, San Quinn, D Motor Youngs, Deceptive Gang. Like, the people that made me want to do this shit. And for all these years, for me to reinvent myself was the moral of the story that my season for being a star as an artist or this or that is seasons, bro. Longevity is to recreate yourself so you can capture the energy from your past that you've seen your success with, but pour it into whatever your new thing is so you can still keep the same passion. Because once your passion go, go out, it's like you lost it right there. Like, even there's people that had platinum albums or artists that's in a bad co contract, con contractual situation. That don't mean you can't be the brand executive to put your face and use your name to help create another movement or a new artist or a new situation where you personally might not be able to put your name on it or be the person that, that this product is, but you are actually helping to create something else that you could probably still make some big money from because you are the one doing it. This mm -hmm. your idea. But once you feel like, man, my manager played me, my label played me, shit didn't go right, my team was acting funny, but you got some type of buzz, that's like Gilly going to podcasting. Mm -hmm. Whatever buzz, whatever didn't happen with Lil Wayne and all the shit, he, he was still able to say, well, shit, boy, I better... He kept talking on the gram until, and then one day he did this. And is there part of you that looks at someone like Gilly, and you're like, "Holy shit!" Like you're probably, like you could probably do that too. You feel like you ever thought about being a podcaster? I think being a filmmaker, this is so beautiful to me, right? It's so simple. But I'm saying, <laughs> I see these cameras, and then I see these lights, and then I see your mic set up, right? But if you was making a movie. This is the same, this is some of the same thing. So mm -hmm. podcasting and having this discussion is easier than making a movie. Like, I love your job. I love your business <laughs> yeah, model. We just made a three hour uh, piece of content without having to break a sweat, right? Just kind of talking. And it's so, it, I believe that we're gonna have to do a part two because there's elements yeah. that is missing. And I hate, I didn't come in here with no notes. <laughs> yeah, because they're working saying, on that. That's hey, a good idea. Do you I like know that. yesterday I was like, this ain't no moment to go in there freestyling, Fig. But then I messed around and overslept a little bit because, you know, <laughs> I drove out here. Yeah. So I never really got to sleep yet. And I'm like, I forgot to write the notes because it's some stuff that I know that he not going to ask me right. that I post a, But I think I gave you so much today. Insane. That you're going to be able to chop this thing up and really pinpoint some key things that's definitely some viral shit because there's people probably just didn't know. I mean, your story is damn near the history of hip-hop because you start so early on and are still like an active participant uh, so active deep participant. to this day. <laughs> It's fucking crazy to just like, th there's so many elements in this story that it's just absurd that the, they all happen to the same person. Between like jumping Tupac and Mag Dre to like being involved with the, the nut and thug thing and all, and like even just the stories about getting shot and then you're in Africa and just fucking, and for some reason you made a fucking phone. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Trap Flicks, man. One day, man, I need to. Hey, listen, y'all stay tuned, man. Trap Flicks. Oh, hold on, too. Amazing. Listen, it's a guy out there, right? Player made. Now, watch this, right? I, I just need to do this. Y'all need to zoom in on this. It's a guy out there. It's two guys, actually. Okay. One named Big Flossie mm -hmm. out of Long Beach. Right. My other brother named Deacon out of Watts. Mm -hmm. And it's situations that happen. I won't, I, I won't even get, I don't even want to go too deep in that. But it's situations that happen out here where I had to come pull up, right? But these two dudes came to make sure, like, nah, bro, I'm coming with you, bro, so nothing don't happen to you. So this Long Beach and Watts, guys, these factors. But my bro made this shirt. My other bro, he is a connoisseur of things I do. The man pull up and got the box. He don't want to sell it to me. I'm trying to buy this. <laughs> I'm trying. Y'all probably think I brought it. My man from Watts bought a bundle of these, and he was, his whole purpose. I'm selling these for thousands of dollars <laughs> later on. Really? Because what you made. 
this ain't normal, bro. Like this, who else made their own phones and tablets? Oh, legendary. You know what I mean? So Soldier Boy said he was gonna. I don't think he did. I did it. I went to China. <laughs> so my man's, I had to shot Deacon out. He he a businessman. Right. My man's right here though made these shirts. Big flossy. Player made clothing company, right? Mm -hmm. Man, this thing is like it's silk cotton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hold on. What type of quality? He said, yeah, man, I, you know, I, I focused on my, you know, the quality, man. It ain't quantity, man. It's the quality. I that's said, real. so I gotta, I had to say something in case y'all see this out there. That's big flossy, that rolling 20 family. You know what I mean? Silk cotton or something, bro. <laughs> what the hell? So I want Silk to shout my cotton. brothers out, man. Amazing, bro. This was an unreal interview. Thank you so much for your time. We should definitely do a part two. Just take take some notes about different stuff that we yes. forgot to dig into. Yes, bro. Yes, man. I appreciate you for having me, man. That was, that was beautiful. You, you know just reminded me why I like doing this shit. Straight up, bro. And I appreciate it coming. That's why I was like, damn, it's... This is a perfect day. Yeah. It's a perfect day. And we and we caught it. And I, I thank you for letting me uh kind of ramble a little because some of nah, the stuff was, I didn't know. Beautiful. Yeah, I know I didn't know it's gonna be this long, but I appreciate you allowing me. Cause I he said, take me back to the beginning. I'm like, oh shit. Oh yeah. No, we needed to do that. That was that was amazing. <laughs> when you said take me back to the beginning. I loved every minute of it. That was incredible. I really <laughs> yes, feel sir. like this is gonna be like a, a classic to a lot of people. Yes, sir, man. Yes, sir. So when should we be expecting this thing? Uh probably next week at some point. Come Hopefully on, it shouldn't it's take too long good. to get ready. Shit, I'm 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 anxiously waiting. Hell yeah. JT, the bigger figure. Salute. And shout out that boy Brick Baby too, man. Hey, hey. listen. Hey, listen, man. You supposed to be in here. I thought you was in the area, bro. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Shout out to Brick Baby, man. All right. <laughs> I like it. Yes, All right, sir. JT. Appreciate you, man. No Jumper. Coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, etc. Like, comment, and subscribe. Nojumper.com if you want to support. Wow.